Welcome to Sikkim 365 Radio. Pistol on second and two. Yates comes in by Foskey. Good interception. That one's going to count. And that's a Jack Kaiser. Notre Dame touchdown. Sikkim 365 Radio is presented by IdealMRI.com. High quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important, so is your budget. Biggest third down in Bryce Young's career. You need 10, play clock at four. From the pocket, launching downfield, underthrown and intercepted. Keely Ringo has an escort down the sidelines. All the way to the end zone, and Georgia is going to conquer the Crimson Tide. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. Dalton end zone, pass is caught. Flag on the play, touchdown Gallup. Now here's Paul Catalina and Craig Smoke. Welcome in, Sick of 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Paul Catalina and Craig Smoke. As I look at the screen, kind of unintentionally matching today. But that's when you're a team, you just think along those same wavelengths. Smokey is off today. Craig's off tomorrow. Uh, So uh, two-man teams here for the next couple of days as we head into the uh, actual season of football. Uh, Ralph Russo, AP, on the show today uh, to talk about the the wild world of college football. Grayson Grunhey for Sikkim365.com joins us a day early at 4 o'clock. Mickey Spagnola at 425. Uh, Craig Smokes off the radar at at 445. And Chip Towers, Atlanta Journal-Constitution at 505. And the top five at five o'clock, which is uh, Texas A and M centric today, Craig, because we've uh, we've talked about them a little bit uh, this week, just kind of in the in passing, want to do a, a segment on it. But uh, a couple of things in college football to start out. First off, and this could have uh, impact into realignment. Uh, Oregon's president, uh, Michael. H. Schill has been named the 17th president of Northwestern University. So he's moving on to the Big Ten's flagship academic institution. And uh, that could have uh, some effects in realignment because Oregon will now have an interim president and interim presidents aren't really charged with really doing anything. They're just kind of charged with driving the boat until somebody is there to take over. So it could be interesting to see how that affects the Pac-12 and realignment and TV deals and all that moving forward because that person uh, will have no actual 
uh, I mean, they have a little bit of power, but it's not like being the president who's the, the, in the permanent job. So it does matter or it doesn't matter? Well, I mean, I think... Because <laughs> they started yeah. off where it mattered, and then by the end, you're like, yeah, it doesn't well, I mean, really matter. I, think, I mean, like, no, the, the person's job, like, their job is just to kind of steer the boat, and you don't want to make any waves as the interim that's going to, you know, affect anybody around you. Because, again, it's not your job full-time. Unless you get that directive from somebody above you, like a region or something, but... So it has no effect then, really? I think it would. Well, I might because, you know, would you jump to a conference? Would you make that decision as a president of school? You just said you don't have any power. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, I'm confused. So the confused. guy has power or doesn't? He doesn't. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So All right, I, I agree with the, you. I'm like, so yeah. it doesn't have any effect on anything. What did I say? I think we're. I think you were saying that it has an effect, and I'm saying so it doesn't have an effect. I don't know. Well, Maybe it, I'm just. It could have wrong. an effect on conference realignment and like stopping it at least. Yeah. For okay. That's it's stopping it. I thought you were talking yeah. about like moving, having an oh, effect. No, no, no. It's like no, it's not going to have any effect because it's not going to have any power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah, on the same page. We're there. on the same yeah. page. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so if there was any kind of forward momentum, this will slow it up at least a little bit. I would think. I mean, maybe. I mean, again, who are we talking about? We're talking yeah, about well, a dude who we all just learned about today yeah. that may or may not have any power. So yeah. uh, if conference realignment gets upended by just some random uh, person to most of the world, who's not random, I realize, to the people who are hiring him and who are you know, going to be listening to him, uh, then that would be certainly a curveball, uh, you know, to have just a whole new character entering the the, the game right in the middle of it or towards the tail end of the final stage. And, you know, all of a sudden here's, oh, boom surprise um so yeah I, I don't know anything about michael shill yeah i have absolutely no idea uh, about you know this guy uh, outside of just what's been reported about him you know going from uh, oregon to northwestern um but you know i, I don't know how like all the politics work at the the higher levels of education you know i i'm a college football fan i realize that with that comes that other stuff as well from time to time certainly we've talked about dr livingstone at baylor and, of course, you're going to know what the ADs and stuff are doing. But when it gets into, like, chancellors and presidents and, um, you know, all that kind of jazz, I, I don't know that landscape nearly as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had the same thought that a lot of other people had as far as, the, you know, the, the pack, you know, Oregon's going to the Big Ten. Ha-ha, in a roundabout way because this guy's going from Oregon to, to Northwestern. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm curious to see what kind of, a, of an effect it has and, and certainly I'm open – to hear from somebody who has a better idea of what this means on to as to, to what this means exactly and whether yeah. or not it matters at all or we're all just looking for anything to try and glean some sort of info on where this is all headed. It's like, oh my God, Oregon's president's leaving for Northwestern. Holy cow, Notre Dame's joining the Big Ten. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, does this matter? Or are we like so in the weeds now uh, that you know we're trying to look for anything that could tip I off us to what's coming next? But no, certainly a school president change is of note. And I, I just don't know to, to what extent they have a say uh, in, you know, blowing the winds of realignment one way or the other. I would think it would just slow it up, you know, on Oregon's part if there was anything going, which I actually think right now there's not. I mean, there is, but there's not. I mean, there's not any, like, real forward momentum because I, we've talked about it for, for days. We don't – until the Big Ten TV deal is officially announced and not – you know, we believe all these things to be true and nobody's come out and contradicted any reports, but – until they know, until all the parties know what's going on, then I, then I don't think anything's really going to move forward. And even then, it might move forward at a snail's pace now compared to what it was. And I, because, again, we don't know anything. I just wonder if this will, you know, throw a wrench in anything just because interim presidents, and I can just tell you from being through several different changes here in my time in Waco at Baylor, the interim doesn't really – rocked the boat very, very much. You know, David Garland, when he was brought in, did a nice job of, of kind of helping to point the university in a direction and calm things down after Ken Starr left. But, I mean, he, he wasn't in charge of any, like, big decisions. Because, again, it wasn't going to be his charge. He was just the interim. They pulled him out of retirement to come back and do it. You know, so those are the kind of things that happen under interim presidents. Uh, well, he was the chair of the Pac-12 CEO board, apparently. I just saw that tweet. Uh, so he had some influence. Um, yeah, what timing uh, for the Pac-12 to have this guy who's the CEO chair or the chair of the, the CEO board uh, to be leaving right in the midst of this. And uh, now for Oregon to have to go the interim route or whatever their plans are 
uh, to replace Michael Schill. I mean, that's all certainly very interesting uh, on the, you know, the more the political side of this thing, but the politics are, you know, what drives a lot of what goes on in, in college sports. So uh, I'm sure this will have, you know, some ramification. I, I would think mostly just up there in that area uh, for the most part. Uh, and, you know, beyond that, uh, yeah, if it does slow things down, then, then that's notable. And if it speeds them up somehow or another that I can't see, uh, then that's notable as well. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see on on that. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not planning on making president news a, a whole regular thing. But in this yeah. in this temperature, I guess, yeah, it is definitely of note. Yeah, and I let off of that just because uh, realignment seems to move the needle. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, we'll see. I mean, it could it could have no effect at all. It could have a tremendous effect. It could have a medium level effect of just slowing down what would be inevitable. But uh, again, we don't know. We don't know what any of that stuff is. Um, uh, earlier today, Jimbo Fisher met with the media, Craig, and we've uh, and we'll get into the top five later, which will, will be fun. But uh, what have we said about A and M and their ranking at, at seven when they don't know who the quarterback is? Uh, I just find it kind of surprising. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you know, um, they still don't know who the quarterback is. Uh, and Jimbo Fisher said, no, everything's – and look, I know he's, you know, trying to put a rosy disposition. That might be fine. Haynes Kink is back full speed. And, uh, you know, everybody looks good in practice. But, uh, you know, very rarely we have a coach say, like, we've had 20 consecutive bad practices and everybody sucks out there. So um, that's just coach speak. I, I kind of get into – a and M, I know their fans are desperate for them to take the next, them to take the next step. Not not like three or four years desperate, like eighty years desperate for them to take the next step. And here they are, still kind of spinning their wheels. And when it comes to the the quarterback position, look, Haynes King was a highly recruited guy. Connor Weigman, highly recruited guy. Uh, Max Johnson has a ton of experience, and I just kind of get the feeling that they might wind up just going with Max Johnson because of the ton of experience that he has, but that doesn't make me feel good about them at number seven. Uh, I think they're highly overrated if that's yeah. the case, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Max Johnson's a fine player. Um, maybe he'll be great there, but that's not like, oh, yeah, they should be number seven because Max Johnson's quarterback. I mean, clearly people think they should be number seven regardless of who the quarterback is, but if it's Max Johnson, quite frankly, like whoever they name, I know that's not their strength anyways, but – yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not inspired by that necessarily. I know some guy, well, who's Blake Shapin or who's, you know, who's that? I mean, we got to wait and see, but no, it's not an inspiring choice. That you, it's not what it's supposed to be. It's not like the top recruit that you've been recruiting over the last, like all these recruiting classes and the transfer quarterback's going to be the one that's their big, their big mm -hmm. starter in this year where they're going to take the next step. Yeah. That just seems kind of weird to me. And, and that means that, you know, they've, they've missed on, on some things because, uh, you know, the transfers come into play uh, quite often, but I feel like when you've recruited like they have, you should not be having to resort to a transfer quarterback. I mean, yeah. am I crazy for thinking that? No. I mean, sure, go plug the linebacker hole or the, the safety that you need because you graduated, guys. But, um, yeah, the fact that it's not one of these great quarterbacks that they've recruited, I understand, you know, being a veteran and having more experience and all of that. But, yeah, I would, I would have been hoping that by now, like, hey, this is Haynes King's team and he's the guy and move forward and he's the guy for the next couple years. And, and instead, it's – well, maybe it's the guy who was at LSU last, and that's just kind of strange to me. But, you know, that's also today's college football. Um, not inspiring, but, uh, you know, not the worst thing either. I mean, he's not a bad player to where he's going to tank anything, but it's just it's just not like the sexy thing, you know. What I thought about Max Johnson was if Max Johnson is your backup quarterback, then that's really good news because he's started it and all that. If Max Johnson is your starting quarterback, well, I mean, we'll see. You know, it could be good news. It could be fine, but I don't think it's it's terrible. And the team around Max Johnson, in theory, should be better than the team that was around him at LSU last season. Again, in theory, but that team also beat AM. Max Johnson beat them mm -hmm. at the end of the year. So, uh, you know, there are all these things. Uh, Garrett, what's your assessment of Max Johnson? I think Max Johnson is a slightly better version of Zach Mettenberger. Okay. I I do. I mean, I think he can. you can win games with, with him, but if you're relying on him to take you to a championship, you're going to be waiting a long time. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think that's what he did. Like, you know, look, if – so if Hank King wins the job, misses a couple weeks because he pulled a hamstring, and Max Johnson has to play, depending, especially depending on who his opponents are – wouldn't worry yeah, a bit. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. But if Max Johnson is your quarterback for 11 of the 12 games, like Zach Calzada was last year, I think they're going to kind of be in the same spot. 
Yeah, I would say. Yeah, where they're going to, you know, lose some games and, and all that. So I don't like, I, I, A&M is a, a tremendously overhyped team. I guess it just happens in this state. I think a lot of college football hype just yeah. comes down to recruiting. Yeah. And then, like if you recruit and you're in that top five or ten or whatever over and over and over again and, you know, you're pulling in these players, it doesn't, you know, translate to something pretty quickly. Then people start, you know, wondering what's what's going on. But, I mean, they've recruited well. And so, yeah, you expect A&M at this point to be in the mix. I mean, if not uh, – dude, like the Jimbo Fisher move alone is them going all out to try to win. Mm-hmm. They're going all out. So I think everybody now at this point just has the question of like, okay, cool, you guys have a lot of money. That's great. Um, and, and there's also this part where it's like if you criticize them at all, it's like you're on the out, you're an outsider that just doesn't get it or whatever. Like there's that weird part to the A and M fandom that I I respect it, but it's like, oh, you just don't understand. It's like no, I very clearly understand. I watch college football long enough. I think I and everybody else just have the question of like, okay, when are you going to be better than eight wins? You know how how much more do you have to invest before it turns into you do get over that hump and you do become a team that is playing for the division title and not just like, oh, that was a great year because we beat Bama and won eight games. Like, you beat Bama, so it, if they didn't beat Bama last year, was that a great year? No. No, of course seven, not. So, like, five, where, yeah. so where are we then? Yeah. So, so you're, you're eight and four is great because that eight, like one of those eight came against Bama. But if not for that win, you're pulling your hair out. And the other thing is, because of the other games you lost, that game meant nothing to Alabama. Exactly. It meant nothing to Alabama. So, and what I felt for, for years, and, and this is beyond true, even going back to the Southwest Conference days, is for the most part, A&M is paying Bentley prices. They're getting Ford Explorer results. Yes. Where, listen, I drove a Ford Explorer for a long time. I loved my Ford Explorer. Yep. It was a great car. It was reliable. But if you had told me I could swap it for a Bentley, I would have done it in a second because a Bentley is a Bentley. And A&M is, is in that huge gap right now where they've got, they're reliable. They're eight and four. They're great. You want to take uh, six people to a, a kid's soccer game? Awesome. Load them up in the Explorer. But uh, the Bentley is is the goal, right? And that's what you've been paying for. You're not paying for the Ford Explorer. And again, I mean no Ford Explorer splendor. As a Ford Explorer Jeep Cherokee kind of a driver exclusively, that's me. But I'm not paying Bentley prices, and I don't expect Bentley performance. If I was paying Bentley prices and a grain of sand got in the engine and threw it off, I'm at the dealership raising hell. And that's where the fans, I think, are about to be if they go 8-4 and four again. Oh, they should be. Yeah. I mean, they better be. I mean, like, again, like... You know, I uh, can respect the hell out of what they've done, uh, you know, in recruiting and uh, in just various facets of fundraising and their facilities. And, of course, they've got great fans. And, you know, la di da di da That's all great. All great. Uh, nobody, I think, has too many complaints about that uh, or, or any digs at that. Uh, I, although I know some people like to dig at, you know, certain parts of, you know, whether it's the yell leaders or whatever. But, hey, that's their tradition. That's cool. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me one way or the other. But, yeah, like, just to put them at top ten, right outside the top five, I'm just curious to know, like, is that legitimate or is this just more fluffy hype that two teams in Texas in particular seem to get on a yearly basis now? Yeah. Uh, no matter what they do on the field. It, and, and, look, and a hasn't been bad on the field. It's just they're, they're team eight and four. That's what they've been for years now. So is this the year where they crack through? I'm interested to see that. Um, and if Max Johnson's the one that leads them there, then great. Um, I just want to see it now because I don't want to roll into next year and they're coming off of eight and four, but they got the number two recruiting class. So let's get hyped up again because quite frankly, I know recruiting's the lifeblood, but I'm kind of sick of that also being the lifeblood of the storylines because yeah, like recruiting matters and those great players matter and you can't win national titles without great players. But I just feel like there's so much emphasis placed on recruiting that it kind of just fuzzies everything yeah. uh, in a way. Um, whether that be expectations uh, from the fans, whether that be expectations from the media or whatever the case may be. But it's like, you know, you don't look any deeper than the fact that they had, oh, they've got three consecutive recruiting classes. They should be this or they should be that. But why are they not? Why are they not? And that's what I want to know about A&M if they don't break through this year. So, okay, the recruiting's not the issue. You know, the facilities aren't the issue. The fundraising's not the issue. The fans aren't the issue. The coach isn't the issue. What's the issue? Like, what – is it going to take to break through there? And maybe AM will answer that this year with Max Johnson. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. and maybe it's Haynes King. I think they're hoping it's maybe Haynes it's King. Maybe it's Haynes King. Considering how much they had to 
you know, recruit him for years to to get him in the fold and the kind of high school career that he had, they would hope trans, translates over there. Uh, Super Chat, $10 from Congo. Thanks, Congo. Do you think the Big Ten schedules will be similar to the NFL schedules with Fox featuring Ohio State, CBS featuring Penn State, NBC featuring Michigan in the first week, and so on where they rotate around? I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of I, similar thing, but I think, it, I mean, college football is different, though, because of – the way the schedule works. Yeah, I mean, I suppose they could do that, but I don't really know why you'd want to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. why would you want to basically, if you're getting rid of divisions and you're expanding, why do you want to turn it back into the NFC and AFC and have yeah. like divisions basically, or in this case, it would be conferences and the Big Ten, I guess, is the league. Um, I suppose there's probably a faction of people that would be in favor of that, but like when we just had this whole big to-do about eliminating divisions, it just seems kind of silly to split them into divisions and have that be the basis for TV coverage. Yeah. I think if you're the Big Ten, uh, you only care about getting the most eyeballs possible, so you wouldn't want to limit, uh, you know, f Ohio State to just Fox and then CBS, like, just talks about him in a highlight. No, CBS wants Ohio State on their channel. I promise you they do. Uh, Fox doesn't want just Michigan playing on CBS. They want Michigan, too. And they want Ohio – like, they signed up for the Big Ten. They didn't sign up for the Big Ten East and West. Mm -hmm. They signed up for the Big Ten. So, yeah, I think all the networks – if you bought a slice of the Big Ten, you didn't buy a slice of a slice. You bought all that comes with that – and I don't know how they sort out who gets the most Ohio State or Michigan or Wisconsin or the L.A. schools games. Uh, but, you know, espe like especially that, like the L.A. schools, you're just going to have them in the Western Division, and that would be like Fox per se. Uh, no, CBS wants USC on their channels. They want UCLA getting their heads kicked in by Ohio State out in L.A., so, no, I, I, I doubt that. Well, and, um, the, and the way that it also works is that the network kind of tells the conference – yeah. where the games are going to be, uh, much like uh, Oklahoma, Nebraska, a year ago was a noon kickoff, and they didn't want to – That am, am I right there? They didn't want to be a noon kickoff and uh, whatever whatever the remember. controversy was. Uh, but, you know, when Nebraska and Oklahoma scheduled that game, Nebraska didn't think that there was going to be a gigantic grand canyon between the two teams and that they would kind of feel like just any other one of the – non-con opponents on that schedule but the you know for example uh ohio state's opening game this year is against notre dame uh at home so they have that at home which means it wouldn't be an nbc game it would be it's an espn game so it's on abc the first week 7 30 eastern time and so if that game was on now if it was now then nbc would get it you know because that it's in the primetime window they would that's probably the game they get first refusal on and all that it goes down the list it's kind of like a it's almost like a fantasy draft the way that they do it where you know you get this and this and then they you know these are the prime games and depending on you know where you are it's it's kind of a complicated that's not complicated but it's a different i just think the networks will rotate getting to pick their games yeah yeah exactly that's what they do every week you know yeah that's why sometimes you'd be like why does why does uh you know uh cbs get this game and espn get this one well because uh this was a better sec game and cbs Picked it because they have the the first pick in the SEC draft when it comes to that that three thirty window or the seven thirty window or whatever the prime window they decide that week is going to be. That's where they throw that one. So yeah, I don't think it's going to work just like that. Um, so we got it's, a, it's an interesting. You know, I, I appreciate the idea, but I think like the the direction everything's going is to go the opposite of splitting things up. Mm -hmm. It's all now converging into bigger pieces. Uh, the Big Ten's getting bigger. Uh, they're not trying to to split. You know into two different kind of entities. I think if you saw anything like that, it's going to be the channels that the SEC's on and the channels that the Big Ten's on, you know, but even then there's probably still going to be crossover. So, no, I don't, I don't think there's going to be um, any separation when it comes to the Big Ten. It would just – it watered down when they don't really need to water down with the amount of brands they have now. Yeah, uh, Wayne Gerbach on the on the uh, chat room uh, says uh, sometimes university boards use inner presidents to get things done that are political centers and viewed as risky for the new presidents. Yeah, I guess that could be part of it, but this just seems to me to be taking over something in midstream that, you know, they would. I mean, risky. I guess risky would be going to the Big Ten, but if that kind of happens. You know, I still think there's some time between that. So you could. I mean, it's a fair point, Wayne, that, uh, yeah, sometimes you can have a, a political patsy, uh, so to speak, on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really putting too much on the Oregon president uh, being a guy who's going to shape and shift 
uh, realignment. I, I just, I, I would need to see far more. But again, as I acknowledged at the beginning of this, I don't have, uh, you know, an entire idea of how all of that works behind the scenes. But just based on a little bit I've read, Pac-12 CEO, you know, chair or whatever, like he had some influence. But I mean, what all... <laughs> What did it get them? It got them absolutely nothing in the long run, really. So he's out the door, and they're in the same spot that he helped get them in. So I, I don't see him being some power, sh- you know, shaker that's now gonna finagle some some uh, realignment buzz. But uh, yeah, I mean, who who knows? I don't I, like I said, I don't know how all this stuff works behind the scenes. But he doesn't seem like that big of a power player, and maybe I'll be wrong on that. Yeah, uh, we're gonna break right here. We've got Ralph Russo from the AP coming up next. I'll get to some of your texts uh, a little bit later. We got some good ones. Baylor Ben definitely gonna answer your question. Two five four three three nine eleven twenty two on the text line. But Ralph Russo from the Associated Press is up next. TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge Checking and Savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. Boots add protection. Good boots help you climb better and move forward faster. And when your son or daughter steps into the boots of a U.S. Army officer, they also learn how to lead. In these boots, they'll gain more confidence with expert training in one of more than 150 occupational specialties. In these boots, they'll stand a little taller and lead a team with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise to successfully accomplish whatever challenge comes next. In these boots, they'll earn respect with valuable experience from day one that will give them solid footing for success into the future. Highly qualified candidates who earn a spot on our team can receive comprehensive health care coverage, college tuition assistance, and a bonus of up to $40,000. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. Hey, this is Bryce Petty, former starting quarterback and two-time Big 12 champion. And I know firsthand the importance of being in top shape both on and off the field. So listen up, men. If you're feeling beat down day in and day out and looking for that high-performance edge that separates the men from the boys, then look no further than the Petty Clinic Low T in Waco. Petty Clinic is a comprehensive men's health care clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Board-certified Dr. Kent Petty has a special interest in offering the highest quality medical care to men of all ages. Some of the services offered include screening and treatment for low testosterone or thyroid, infertility, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, while offering comprehensive wellness exams and complete men's health lab panels. High performance men, remember, it's not just a petty thing. This is Bryce Petty encouraging you to reach out and Google search Petty Clinic Low T or go to PettyClinicLowT.com and get your complimentary lab screening today. Parenting is full of surprises. You never know what to expect. So after our son was born, I called my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent to set up a life insurance policy in case something happened to me. Sawyer is now two. And we'll soon have a sister. There's no one else I would trust with protecting my family. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. We are uh, working on Ralph Russo. Maybe he'll call back in just a second. I can take it on the fly here, or I might have Emery answer that phone. So, Emery... Be at the ready if I wave you over uh, to answer the phone, and I'll uh, 
I'll, I'll deal with that. But, uh, I mean, and again, like, it's good with Ralph. We can kind of talk about, you know, all the stuff that's gone on because he's covered uh, college football for a long time and uh, what's to come. Okay, here's uh, here's here's Ralph. I can just go right there. Ralph Russo, Associated Press, joins us now. Sigum 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Uh, Ralph, uh, thanks for hopping on the show today. Um, what, to, you know, we, we have, we've had you on several times. Uh, what is your uh, mindset now covering this game after yet again, another summer of craziness in college football? <laughs> yeah, it's, it has been three pretty wild years starting with uh, the COVID year. Last year was sort of like the year of the Supreme Court and NIL decision. And now, you know, we've got just another round of, 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 of um, um, realignment, television rights deals. I, I guess what I, what I kind of feel like is I, I, I find myself not writing that much about players and coaches anymore, mm-hmm. uh, but more about policy and law and antitrust law and television value and things along those lines, which, you know, it, it's, it's an important part of the sport and it certainly makes things interesting. I certainly don't mind covering those issues but they really have overwhelmed the on the field stuff uh, for the last couple of years. And, and frankly, that's a little disappointing. That's a little disappointing. But once we get into the season, it, it definitely we're able to shift it more toward the on the field. Not, not completely. There's still a lot of issues going on, but more toward on the field. Where do you see the tide going now that we – know mostly what the Big Ten TV deal is going to be. Uh, I guess the only thing we haven't really heard is what the streaming part is and and that and, and you know, how no, you know, Notre Dame's kind of thrilled about that deal because it's good for them no matter what they do. Where do you think the the tide is turning as it go as it yeah, as, as far as realignment goes? Yeah, I mean I think the the piece that needs to be sorted out is more more quickly is is Pac-12 Big 12, right? Like what what's going on? And and they're related in so far as I think you know the Pac-12 teams have to figure out like do we want to move forward together? I think that's their number one preference, but there's a lot of reasons why you know that could fall apart. Um, and, and all of a sudden that they're kind of looking at each other, thinking first of all the Big Ten could go shopping again. It does not feel like that is imminent i can't stress this enough like i don't think there is any like sort of urgency within the big 10 offices to get bigger sooner but i also think that there is like real deliberation here and real like sort of like okay what kind of value is left on the board beyond notre dame and i think it because it's not obvious value it, it sort of it sort of decreases the lack of urgency here, but it does sort of linger over everything like a cloud. And I think for the SEC, there's sort of this like, well, if we if the Big Ten moves, do we have to move? We're really not looking to make a move. So there's sort of these like dark clouds on the horizon, but nothing really imminent. And if you take away that, it, it's sort of like, okay, Pac-12, what do you want to do? Like, you you want to hang together, or you think you're going to fall apart here, and that could provides an opening for the big 12 and i don't think anything we're gonna i don't think we're gonna know anything exactly on the pac 12 maybe for another couple of months as they sort of move out of their exclusive window negotiating their tv contract with bspn and maybe shop around a little bit so i guess and not to be long-winded, there is a there is an option here where ESPN gives them just the right number that they want, and they scoop it up. Hey, it's a complicated topic. I mean, there's, there's not really a yeah. short way to answer it, but I, I do have this question about kind of the higher uh, parts of leadership at, in universities. Ralph, uh, I'm sure you saw the news about uh, Oregon's president uh, moving yeah. over to, to Northwestern, <laughs> and I saw all the, the reaction of like, oh, my gosh, what, is, what does that mean really anything when it comes to the college athletics part of this? <laughs> I mean – so you have to understand the presidents do hold a lot of sway. And that's a president in Oregon president, uh, Michael Schill, I believe his name was a chili at Schill, um, who is very involved in athletics. He's on like NCAA boards and college football playoff oversight stuff. So that's a president who has a, who has a role in athletics. And then you sort of extrapolate that out to the idea that when when conferences decide on teams to take or schools to invite, 
the presidents have a lot of say in that. So I think you start drawing these conclusions, but probably jumping to conclusions that it means something. Mm -hmm. I saw my colleagues sort of doing the same thing. And I was, I was tempted to tweet, I don't know what this means, but here's something like, right. cause I, I don't like, I don't know if we really know what it means, but like, there's clearly, you could sort of start like connecting dots, right? If you really wanted to. I would say at the very least, Oregon would have some support on the board. And that's, that's where I would, you know, of the presidents in the big 10, if it comes to that, but that's the last thing I think I could, I could even safely assume. Yeah. And, and you know, the way it's been described to me is, like, I think that, again, there's a value cal calculation here going on with all these other key, all these other schools, and they've already done a lot of work on Oregon and Washington and Stanford and, and just like they, they have, a, they've done their homework, let's put it that way. And I think they sort of understand sort of what's on the board. And then it's a matter of like evaluating where does the, you know, where, how does it help us? Um, so, you know, again, does it help to have an advocate in the room? Might, it might, but, but, but it's, it's hard to really tell now. It definitely was one of those moments where like, I don't know what this means, but it seems very exciting. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> absolutely. That was, that was exactly my reaction to it. It was like, I don't know, but Hey, let's see if it does matter. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. But, <laughs> right. uh, Ralph, the uh, college football playoff, it's set up its schedule for, uh, it's rankings releases, and obviously that's a big piece. You know, when all the Big Ten, uh, or not even just the Big Ten, but all the media days, hoopla was going on, and all these quotes were flying left and right. One of the big ones was obviously having to do with some changed feelings, uh, per se, on the, the playoff. Uh, where do you think we sit with that and any evolution or changes to it? Are we sitting pat for a while, or how do you kind of view that at this point after all that's taken place over the last few months? So, yeah, they're going to start meeting again and digging into this stuff in the next, uh, you know, couple of months. I, I think they have a couple of scheduled and there could be a couple more over between like late August and mid October. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if you've got some momentum moving more, a little more quickly now. I, I do think that, you know, the Big Ten sort of has loosen this its stance and listen again i don't want to be super long-winded we can go into the minutia of i think of all this wrangling but let's not do that i i'll just safe to say that i think there's an opportunity here for after last year's snarled traffic jam for things to sort of open up and everybody to sort of finally get on the same page i'm not i know a lot of people were very excited about this idea of 16 and it sort of made the round and I'm not saying that they're not talking about a lot of different options, but I don't know if that was, if there was sort of like, that was portrayed as momentum towards 16, as opposed to just like, hey man, we're talking about a lot of things. And sure, we're going to talk about 16 too. Yeah, the the 12 team proposal that they had last year, I mean, it almost brought a tear to my eyes, a college football fan, Ralph. It, it seems so well uh, thought out, you know, as far as yeah. all yeah. these things. And, <laughs> you know, like they, they really did sit in a room and say, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? They had, for the first time in a long time, it was a college football plan that had answers to a lot of questions. And then it got wrangled up because of, like you said, minutia. So I would think that throwing 16 maybe makes 12 like, it just seems like, well, we agreed on 12, but 16 was in there. It seems like one of those things you throw out politically, so it seems like everybody came to an agreement that they'd already come to a year ago. Yeah, I mean, there could be a little of that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up getting to what we were talking about last year, which would be quite ironic to have wasted a year and go to the land exactly where you were. Um I just haven't figured out what the what the motivations for 16 are. I really did. I, I'm with you. I, when I when I sketch these things out on my notepad when I'm on long flights, like uh, the the 12 thing, even before they unleashed it, sort of like had a lot of good answers to some of the questions I was asking, uh, and and I thought I thought it it, it it checked a lot of boxes too, and it still does to me. So I, I still feel like that's the right answer. But, you know, listen, uh, you know, all of a sudden the SEC has got to re re readjust or and, the, and you just have now these constituencies sort of getting in their corners again and saying, well, you know what? What did I want the last time that I didn't get lit, that I didn't get? Maybe I'm going to try to get that this time. Right. You just have some of the some of the power brokers who have a little more leverage now might want to throw a little weight around on some things. And my guess is that 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 isn't ends up being in the realm of 
who has automatic access to this thing. Ralph, this is a very generic question because I was thinking about asking you about your piece on the you know the ESPN, the TV rights. But like you said, we don't talk a whole lot of college football. What are one or two kind of college football storylines that are intriguing to you as we get closer? Yeah, I think, listen, I think the most interesting part of this season playing out on the field is, and maybe this is me trying to like encourage people to embrace, uh, embrace the fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't know if the national championship race is going to be particularly fun. I, I really do think that you have sort of Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State on a little bit of a different level than any of everybody else this year as far as their roster composition. But, but do not fret. I think beyond that, it looks like a muddled mess. I, I like, I, I, you know, the, the, the AP college football polls, uh, preseason poll is going to come out on Monday, August 15th. Um, we like to think that that's the standard, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, so, and if you, and if you start, like, I, I don't want to reveal what's what, but I think once you get past, you know, what you might assume to be the top three, I think everybody's got a ton of questions. And I think that, like last year, could lead to a lot of interesting races and conferences and a lot of maneuvering around. I think it's really going to be hard to pin down who the second, you know, what the second tier of contenders are. And to me, that could make for a really exciting season. Uh, Ralph, do you, I mean, without revealing, do you, do you see teams, like just say in the other poll, that have been a little bit overrated in your estimation? Um, pr probably a little bit. I, again, I hate, to, I hate to bash the coaches' poll. I mean, you know, listen, the Texas thing, I'm sure you guys have talked about. <laughs> yeah. that, that was weird. Yeah, that was weird. Um, I, you know, the other thing, too, is, though, I will say this. Because we, and I, when I say we, not we, the AP, I mean we, the sort of college football, you know, industrial complex, media <laughs> which is honestly even include you right like it's just all of us we start ranking teams the day after the national championship game for the next season yep. so i think it's really hard to not ending up and to not end up with a little bit of a group think because we've been sort of going through this process of january way way too early and then there's post spring and then there's this and then there's post portal and so I do think that you end up getting sort of like a story or a narrative that like sort of lands as the season goes on. So by the time you get to pre quote unquote preseason polls, I, I think a pecking order has been set to a certain degree. So you may have slight variances, but I don't think you're going to have wild variances between what, between people's opinions. And I, I just don't know what to, what to do about that. I think it's just, it's just the nature of where we are in that right now. I would love to, to just hear the pitch from the one person who gave Texas that vote <laughs> oh, just to hear what they think that the rest of us wouldn't at this point from a team that was five and seven a year ago because there might be some really interesting insight in that. So I don't want to call out coaches because I don't <laughs> think that's fair. But, of course, myself and everybody else looked at that list and started going through, okay, there's two possibilities here. A, somebody was trolling Texas. Mm -hmm. B, somebody is, like, sort of, like, buddies with Sark. Right? <laughs> and just, like, has maybe too much respect. And, like, and again, like, I really don't want to call people out, so I'm not going to do that because it's kind of reckless, reckless speculation. But, like, you definitely went through the list and went, like, Oh, I could see that. Yeah, I could see this guy maybe just like thinks very highly of Texas because he's got some association uh, with that staff. And pl but again, I think what that was more interesting is to try to figure out what coach might be trolling Texas. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't like the one that came to mind to me first and foremost is actually not on the panel. Like I could see Chip Kelly doing that. <laughs> I, could, I could see Chip Kelly sort of being like, "Out oh, of hell with this! I'm just going to put Texas on top." <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, looking forward to the poll release on Monday um, and uh, looking forward to the actual season where we can talk about, you know, uh, running backs and quarterbacks and yeah. defense and all that stuff that we normally do and not uh, the minutia of television contracts, which unless we're in television, we all don't completely understand. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've somehow become like I've needed a law degree to do my job the last couple of years, and I, nobody ever nobody ever told me I needed that. Yeah, uh, you know what? That just made me think of another question, Ralph. To, to close this on oh, out, sure. what, what do you think of sort of the year-round nature that college football has now taken, thanks to 
recruiting having boomed over you know the last couple decades that's been a, a work in progress where it's just gotten so big now but that helped to kind of keep the off season moving along but now you have all of the other things attached to it uh, it's like the nfl turned into ultimately where there is no off season what do you make of that as somebody who covers the sport yeah, listen, it's hard to take vacations, uh, but that's not, but don't, but please don't, please don't feel sorry for me. I got a great job. No, I, I would, I, I actually, I know people like bristle about transfer portals and how coaches bounce everywhere and things like that. But I think if you just look at the model for pro sports, if you have off season transactions, uh, and player movement, it does really increase the interest in a sport. It keeps you people engaged in the off season and between recruiting and transfers and, you know, coach movement. There's so much of that now in college sports. Again, like I understand people sort of cringe, oh, I don't want it to be pro sports, but the pro sports will model will show you that when you engage people in the off season, that way you, you build fandom. Ralph Russo, Associated Press. Ralph, thanks for hopping on the show. Thanks, guys. Always great to talk to Ralph and uh, an interesting insight there that, again, yeah, you have to, you have, to have a law degree yeah. almost to, to follow this completely. Yeah, in some ways, and, you know, he's he's like us. We'll see on, the, you know, Oregon president and things like that, but he, he, he had the same reaction that I think we all did of just could matter, but we don't know really if it matters. But, hey, if it does, you know, like, we'll, we'll see. Basically, that's that's a whole lot of uh, college football now is we will see. But, yeah, I mean, I, I thought for a second about asking him about Sam Hartman's injury or – you know, any number of other things, but uh, kind of the stuff that we, we touched on is, is the bigger talking points at, at this stage. And I think until we get into, you know, seeing Wake Forest play for a couple of games, you know, then you start to get into, okay, like now the Hartman thing and the impact and all of that, uh, it's clearly going to have an impact on the Demon Deacons. But those types of storylines, like we can rant and rave on his opinions on who the A&M starting quarterback is going to be, but it's going to be a lot more fun to ask him after they start off 2-0 and or 1-1 and or whatever they're going to be and be like, hey, what do you think about Max Johnson's performance yeah. thus far? Like, yeah. God, can we get to that point yeah. already? I can't wait to see what happens, like, if – Whatever happens in that a and Miami game is going to be really intriguing to me because yep. if it's a great game and comes down to the end, then I think it'll confirm what a lot of people think about both teams, no matter who wins because it's, it's an evenly matched game. Uh, or if, you know, one team blows out the other one, especially if it's Miami rolling into Kyle Field and, and hanging, you know, a bunch of points on A&M, that's going to change what everybody, everybody thinks. I don't think it'll be that way, but uh, – you know, if a and blows out Miami, does it make you think like, well, you know. No, I don't think Miami's rolling in and beating a No, no, I don't I don't think that's happening. No, um, but like, th those are the things you want to right, talk about. but like, I want to see it. Kind of, yeah, I want to see it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've had fun with the, the, you know, the speculation part's fun, but like we've had so much of it at this point that you kind of need to, to bite on some actual physical, like, facts in, in, in our faces with the, the outcomes and, you know, conference races and things like that rivalry games and all that comes with that so yeah i mean it's just it's really wetting the appetite and ramping up the uh, excitement levels for what's going to start unfolding here in about three weeks from now so we're closing in and uh, i thought it was interesting that he said you know on the the realignment stuff of yeah this isn't like we're not getting an answer on the end game of this in like the next couple of weeks we're not even going to have an answer on the end game in the next year probably um, yeah. this is something that's going to be uh, evolving as the next couple of years at the very least unfold until all of these new TV deals are signed mm -hmm. and the Big 12s in 2025. Uh, the Pac-12 obviously is coming up soon, but like no one has a grip on what they're going to actually even be able to do uh, with their, like, is there a you know, long-term agreement made with the schools involved in, in the Pac-12? I mean, we'll see that soon enough. We'll see the Notre Dame uh, contract here in a couple of years. Uh, but you would think in the meantime, then we were are for certain going to see the Big Ten contract, and that's not going to include Notre Dame unless there's a big surprise waiting. Well, if, either way, that's notable. So, yeah, like there's still um, – I think until the conferences, you know, and basically the SEC and Big Ten are going to be locked down in the next you know month probably. Uh, but in the SEC, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they reconfigure that a little bit because of the Big Ten's numbers. Mm -hmm. But – uh, yeah, once we see these TV deals that are signed by the PAC and then ultimately uh, the, the well, first Big Ten, but then the PAC and then, you know, the Big 12 here in a couple of years, um, I wonder where we will be when that when that happens and, and kind of what the money figures are and what the ACC is feeling like at that point. And yeah, there's a lot to, to sort through, but it's not going to be sorted through quickly. Well, I wonder if the SEC has one of those um, 
I call it the Bob Stoops escalator clause, but everybody kind of has it now. But it was I think it was Bob Stoops who was the first one where he had the escalator clause in his contract where he was always going to get paid. Like, whenever there was a high, like a, a coach that, it's what put WCW out of business. <laughs> yeah. They really was. Yeah, back, in, like, back in the yeah. day in wrestling, WCW had boatloads of Ted Turner money yeah. and basically put Eric Bischoff in charge of the company, and he signs Hulk, uh, Hulk Hogan, and he signs Kevin Nash, and he signs Scott Hall. Well, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were so brilliant because they were carnies. Uh, that's what wrestlers are. They were carnies uh, that they negotiated an escalator clause. So when... You know, the next guy came in who was making Book, who's like Bret Hart comes in, he's making six million. Well, then you automatically go from four to six. And then, yeah. you know, that Sid Vicious comes in, he's making eight. Well, then you automatically go to eight, no matter what you did. I was, I'll never have a contract like that. But man, it sounded sweet. Yeah, it sounded be, super sweet. That would be awesome. Yeah. Every time just goes up and up and up. When we come back, answer a couple of your questions on the text line and the chat room really quick. Then Grayson Grunhafer, Sigum365.com. At 4 o'clock, this is 365 Sports, Second 365 Radio. Cars price right both day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks built for you, red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Ben Erlinson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Ben Erlinson, 100 North 6th Street in Waco, 254 759 8533. Edward Jones, member SIP. Did you know the average American pays over $500 a month for their car payment? What would you do if you didn't have to make that payment for 90 days? Where else could you use $1,500? Keep your car payments at Genco. Buy new or refinance your current vehicle and have no payments for 90 days. Take advantage of our low rates and no payments for 90 days. Only at Genco. Subject to credit approval, membership eligibility, and loan policies insured by NCUA. My money, my future, my credit union. It's summertime, there's picnics, reunions, cookouts, and so much to do. And Waco Custom Marketplace on Lake Air Drive in Waco is your home for the butcher shop that can help you with beef, pork, poultry, and seafood. They are spectacular at being able to deliver you whatever cut of steak you want. Bone and ribeye, however thick you want it, that's great, they'll do it. Sirloin, T-bone, porterhouse, bacon wrap filet. And of course, as I mentioned, they have pork, poultry, and seafood. Their Norwegian salmon is spectacular. Also, all of the sauces and seasonings you'll ever need, all the ingredients you'll ever need to make sure you have that perfect, flawless taste. So it's delicious whenever you take something off the grill. And a full-fledged bakery as well with fresh baked bread and kolaches every single day up and down the aisle of Waco Custom Marketplace. You also have what you need from knickknacks to snacks to more at 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. Waco Custom Marketplace. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injuries, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, wants to get you back in the game. Let Camille Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one. Commercial, farm and ranch, or residential, Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction. With a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you, Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming. Warm. Welcome home. 
This is Sikkim 365 Radio. Text us at 254-339-1122. The Sikkim 365 Radio text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. Welcome back, Sikkim 365 Radio 365 Sports. Short segment here, going to answer a couple of text questions, and we got a break for Grayson Grunhafer get caught back up again. Uh, Baylor Ben uh, on the text line: The Big Ten is getting more than they are worth, right? As far as actual good football teams outside of OSU, overvalued. I, I kind of share this sentiment, but like overvalued, you're as worth as what somebody will pay for you. But I do think there is some, and like the SEC, there is some. Uh, propaganda built into these TV deals sure. a huge way in that like, hey, there's nothing like this kind of football. There's nothing like this kind of football. And what the Pac-12, Big 12, and ACC have not done well enough is sell themselves past the top brands. Yep, and that's it. what... Uh, what the SEC and Big Ten have done has have this collective like, man, this is great no matter what game it is, but they're no different than anyone else. No, they're really not, man. And, you know, this is where the tried and true tradition of college football fandom comes into play where it doesn't matter what we've done lately. Look at all these trophies over the last 100 years. You know, there's always a, a pivot to why your argument is the better argument. And for the Big Ten, their history is often what they can fall back on or the size of their schools or the endowments or all of those types of things. And so that's where it's an, it inevitably leads. And then if you have the conversation with the SEC, the brilliant thing that the SEC did was not the ESPN propaganda that started in the early 2000s. It was they actually went out and won some big effing football games. When LSU upended Oklahoma, we didn't talk about LSU back then the way we talk about them now. Man, that was the start of the LSU rise and run where over the last 20 years, they're now like an undeniable blue blood. And you're like, yeah, you take it like the top 10, 15 programs out there. It's LSU. But prior to that win over Oklahoma, they were a really good program, but it wasn't like... We talk about them now, um, but they win, and Alabama becomes what they become under Saban. And uh, you had um, you were fresh off of Spurrier in the late '90s in Tennessee as well with uh, Peyton Manning in particular. But that was that was hit or miss. Like Peyton Manning didn't win a national title. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alabama was on NCAA investigation for like a lot of the '90s. Uh, They had you know had the success like right there early on in the '90s. But as the '90s went along, man. The schools who are now departing the Big 12 who are already were kind of running the show. It was Nebraska, and it was Oklahoma, and then outside of that, it was Miami, and it was Florida State. I didn't grow up when the SEC was dominant. I grew up when they were just another conference, quite frankly, and there was no way that I ever would have thought that like, they would be so far on this pedestal like 10 years later. Um, that just that never would have crossed my mind, but it was – Brilliant because there was a strategy in place. There was definitely some propaganda on ESPN's part, but the reason why you can't deny it or argue against it is because they did what you have to do and what the Big Ten's going to have to do ultimately. They went out and won. Mm -hmm. They went out and won. And LSU won. And then Florida won. And then Alabama started winning. And here's Georgia's winning. And in the meantime, Auburn won. And I mean, that's five teams right there that have won national titles in the last 20 years from one conference. The, the count for the Big 12 is Oklahoma and Texas. And that's not even the last 20 years. Actually, that's just Texas now at this point. Yeah. You know, in the Big 10, you've got Ohio State. But outside of that, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of just looking the, around the room. The ACC has two. The SEC has two. So, I mean, that's where the SEC turned. Like, if the SEC would have just been pretty good – but, you know, o- Oklahoma had won a couple more of their titles or Nebraska had stayed where they were and they had won one and it all just kind of evened out, then I don't think we'd all be viewing yeah. them as like at the altar of the gods of football. They're really not. That, that I grew up when they weren't. But because they've had this dominant run that has now turned into NFL draft picks and championships and you can't talk about college football without talking about them, I mean, it's just brilliant. It worked out brilliantly in the end. Uh, for for everybody in the SEC, and now that's why they've got these historic paydays. And the Big Ten mostly is just big markets and big history and big endowments and, and big people behind the scenes and big power brokers, and that's got them to the point where Ohio State's really carried the load, and now you've got a, a Michigan that's at least carrying some of that water as well getting into the playoff. 
But if we look up in 20 years and it's still only Ohio State's been winning titles, then I think that'll be fascinating. And if we look up in 20 years, I wouldn't be surprised to see like 10 different schools that have won national championships of the SEC. Yeah. That's why you can't deny their – their greatness, so to speak. I do think it goes over the top quite yeah. often of, like, nobody else can compete. Well, well, they're not set up to try and compete well, in I mean, that. Yeah. Like, yeah, and then as the rules changed, you also boxed everybody exactly. out. Exactly. The rules so, benefit you. Yeah, they're, yeah, they box everybody out. So, again... Um, so, I'm not denying its greatness. I'm saying it's just... It, it's, if it would have been, been a lot different to look on it now, and I wonder if we'd even be talking about it the way that we are now, if it wouldn't have been for the fact that multiple teams out of that conference went and showed up and talked the talk, but they also walked the walk. And that's what yeah. nobody else has been able to do in any other conference. And that's why the SEC is, is who they are now. It's not because they've got the best fans or because they're in the South or... All of that can be like, you know, icing on the cake. The cake is the fact they've had a handful of teams win national titles in the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to a point you made on like how many trophies you've had over 100 years. Here's my new rule you cannot brag about your trophies for a national championship if the cheerleaders' names were Gertrude, <laughs> Myrtle, Verna, Edith, Verna, Esther. Like, no, no, no. You can only brag about... Well, you can brag about but, those but, if they've been paired with, like, three or four in the last 30 yeah, years, you but know? But you can't, you can't say, like, listen, that was great. If the, if the football players are dating girls named Gert, you can't. <laughs> it was too long ago. You're really going at A&M today. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long ago. Dang, yeah. yeah. Look, and look, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm like, I grew up in Bleeding Maroon. I'm kind of just going through my own thing right here when it comes to that because of my family. But, but again. But circling back, we do treat the Big Ten like they're the SEC and why. Yeah. They haven't even anywhere near the results on the field in the last 20 years that the, the SEC has. Yeah. Um, but they're on par because, again, big markets, big brands, big history, big power brokers, and, and all of that. they got big eyeballs, that's for sure. Um, but the SEC is the one that's been you know stacking up the trophies. So I'm curious to see with this Big Ten deal, by the end of it, whenever that is, because we don't know just yet when that will be, I mean, how many more titles has Ohio State won? I feel confident they'll probably have won one or two at the very least, probably. Uh, just going off of, of averages. But how many has Michigan won or Wisconsin won? Or their new schools, how many have they won, yeah. you know? And uh, the Pac-12, I mean, part of the reason they've sort of fallen out of favor is because, again, it's been, it was USC 20 years ago, and since then it's Oregon and Washington popping into the playoff for a cup of coffee, and outside of that, there's nothing, right? Yeah. Big 12, why do they get knocked? Because the only teams that have won are Texas and Oklahoma, and those are both now at this point – 20 years old or about to be. <laughs> and then when they had a chance to get one of their off-brand, not off-brand, but non-big-name teams in, they messed it up. They screwed it up. They Just messed totally it up. Screwed. Then last year, you know, Oklahoma State could have gotten in. They lose to Baylor at the yeah. very end. So, you know, there's been, if you look back at history, like, yeah, what would have happened if Baylor or TCU had gotten or, into the playoff? If, if Iowa State hadn't beaten Oklahoma State uh, with Brandon, that Brandon Wheaton Exactly. Yeah. Oklahoma State has a couple of, of different times you could point to where them getting into the playoff or playing for a national title could have changed the entire trajectory because they wouldn't be viewed the same way they are viewed right now as, as like not one of the, the people involved in the, in the championship scene. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's ultimately why the SEC is where they are is because they've had multiple teams go out and win titles over this period where so much has been changing, and, and you can't deny that. I mean, proof is in the pudding. They've talked the talk. And a lot of that talk is, is kind of BS at times, but they backed it up and they've walked that walk and, and you can't help but respect that because, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break right here. When we come back, Grayson Grunhey for Sikkim365.com. 365 Sports, Sikkim365 Radio. Back in a moment. During the Make This the Summer event, Alan Samuels is celebrating with an incredible lineup of new 2022 models like the Grand Cherokee, Grand Cherokee L, Renegade, Wrangler, and the Wrangler 4XE. These vehicles bring power, style, and a smooth ride you'd expect from a Jeep. The Grand Cherokee L even brings you extended seating with a third row. Come see what Alan Samuels can offer you and your family and find the Jeep SUV that fits your lifestyle. Baylor University is where lights shine bright. So, let there be light. Let there be roommates and teammates, scholarship and championships. Let there be fresh starts and new traditions, fast friendships and lasting impacts. Let there be laughter. Let there be joy. Let there be light. Baylor University. 
where lights shine bright. Do you or your kids get nervous about going to the dentist? Stonewood Dental, Dr. Steve Childress, he can help. I've spent a career taking care of patients who as children had bad experiences, and now they're adults that hate going to the dentist. If I get a kid at three years old, and they come every six months, and it's a happy experience, it's normal for them. Now they have an accident at six or seven or eight at school. Now they have a broken tooth or a trauma, and they have to come here. They're used to lights, they're used to water in their mouth, they're used to experience, they already trust us. It's amazing what we can do with that kid without it being a negative thing. But if I see a six or seven or eight year old that's never been in the dentist, and now they have a trauma or an unfortunate, unexpected toothache, it's harder to do that for that kid and it not be somewhat of a negative experience. So bottom line is I try to teach kids and adults and teenagers their body the way I'd want my family treated, which is where it's a necessary part of life. You just take care of it. It doesn't have to be that big a deal. Learn more. Stonewood-Dental.com. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lake Shore Drive, North 19th Street, right behind the bank, is a hidden gem in Waco. If you're a fan of bourbon, especially local Texas bourbons, that's where you gotta go. Balcones, TX, Devil's River, whatever it is, they've got it. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, plus the best selection of craft beers in Waco, seasonally churned out throughout the year. Whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter, Riverbend Liquor and Wine, best selection of craft beers, a speedy drive through window, an excellent customer service. Find out more on Instagram or just go by and see them. Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street behind the bank. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible and rewarding challenge. Hi, everyone. This is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like mortgage lending, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. The First National Bank of Central Texas, familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. In the market for a quality metal building? Since 1943, Pioneer Steel and Pipe has helped Central Texas residential and commercial customers with metal building design, panel options, building components, and trim options. Pioneer Steel and Pipe's residential line is energy efficient, offers low maintenance, reduces insurance payments, is impact resistant, and carries up to a 45-year limited warranty. In addition, they can also help you find a metal building contractor for your project. Pioneer Steel and Pipe with locations in Waco and Bryan and at PioneerBoys.com. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. They go to the eye. Play action. Bohannon back in the end zone. And a touchdown for Baylor. Great Dabney's second catch of the drive. And it's good for six. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's Paul Catalina and Craig Smoke. Welcome back, Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports. At Sikkim365.com, recruiting analyst Grayson Grunhafer joins us now. Grayson, you have... uh, you have been out at Baylor practice this week, and you can't glean much from what they let you see. But what are the things that have jumped out at you on the surface? Because that's really all we get to see when you're at practice is kind of the surface level what's going on. Yeah, for sure. I think the biggest things that I kind of take away from it are kind of the cohesiveness of kind of just the entire coaching staff and the players. I mean, it just seems like everyone is on the same page and, I think when that happens, that's a, you know, a really good thing. That's, that's a team that's getting ready to try to go repeat as Big 12 champs. So that cohesiveness has been really cool to see. It seems like they're all focused and ready to try to accomplish the same goal. Um, I would also say I think the depth, especially on the offensive and defensive lines, has been really apparent. And I think a lot of that starts with recruiting, but also a lot of it is from development and just having a lot of really good older guys as well. Um, but you look at the young guys and you go, man, I can see why they, you know, wanted him in their, you know, certain classes because they're just so big and they fit the athletic profile that the Baylor staff wants. And um, when you have a bunch of guys like that who are athletic and big and strong, uh, that leads to really good things. 
And I think Baylor was really happy with how they kind of dominated in the trenches a year ago. And I think they're going to be even better at that on the offensive and defensive lines for next year. Um, so, yeah, it, it's an exciting time, I think, for the program. It seems like everyone's really excited. So those have been some of my main uh, kind of takeaways, just kind of on the outside looking in. Um, you know, I think we've also seen some position changes as well. You know, looking at Al Walcott potentially moving to the star position after being really, really good at cornerback a year ago. Lorando Johnson, who played star last year, playing some cornerback uh, in the fall as well. So those position changes, I think, have been really intriguing as well. Grayson, uh, here we are about three weeks out from the start of the season at this point. Uh, we kind of know what the storylines have been, but has there been anything, I guess, answered uh, that you were curious about maybe a couple weeks ago now that practice have got underway that, that stands out to you? Yeah, you know, I, I think that our assumption that Baylor is going to be really good up front, I think, is the first area. I think that's just kind of the obvious one, just how deep they truly are. Um, I would also say, you know, I think Blake Chapin is another kind of area that I've had my questions answered because coming into fall camp, I know Blake won the quarterback battle against Gary in the spring, but I think we all kind of sat back and went, you know, he played really good in the Big 12 championship game, um, but he hasn't played a ton. You know, is he really going to come in, be a leader, and just kind of take over the quarterback room? immediately or is this going to be a learning curve he's still a young guy um but i think from what i've seen in fall camp i see a guy that's pretty locked in pretty focused on the task at hand and he just seems like a very talented individual who's very excited and ready to go for the season and uh I, he seems calm and collected while also being very talented and doing the things on the field that i think we all saw in the spring so he's another one that's kind of that's been a question that's been answered for me is that i really think baylor's in good hands offensively with him at quarterback and I think there's a huge upgrade there from a season ago all right fill in the blank here Baylor will win most of their games if Squirrel Williams gets x number of touches a game <laughs> um x number of touches um and they'll win most of their games well wow, that's actually a really tough question because I don't know that touches for squirrel are going to dictate whether they win games or not but I guess I would probably put the number right around you know 12 to 15 so how, how about we go on the high side how about 15 if he gets 15 touches a game and he's able to last throughout the entire season I think Baylor's going to be really really tough to beat in those games just because he's so dynamic when he's been healthy um, it's all about being healthy and being durable throughout the season. So we'll see if he can do that. But I'll, I'll put it at 15. Grayson, uh, where are we in terms of recruiting right now? Baylor obviously got uh, a local commit just a few days ago, uh, but they're well over 20 now at this point. Um, not a lot of – I mean, I'm sure they've got some wiggle room, but it's not like they can sign as many as they want to. So there's – you know, they got to be careful about how they close it out. But with the season approaching and the season of these recruits approaching and fall camp underway – is recruiting still as hot and heavy, or is it kind of slowed down in your estimation? Yeah, I would say it's definitely in a period of, um, you know, it's where it's slowed down some. And, and I think most of the prospects that we've talked about, most of the prospects that have been on Baylor's radar throughout the summer have either committed to Baylor or Baylor's moved on or those guys have committed elsewhere. So it feels like Baylor's in a great spot right now, 24 commits. Uh, in August, which is a dead period. So they're going to go into the fall with probably two to three spots available in this class. And I think they want to save those. I think they want those to be used on guys who are going to take visits in the fall. I think the other part of it is I think the staff believes they're going to have a really good season. And if Baylor has a really good season and some other programs don't, you know, you might be able to see Baylor flip some guys or get more competitive with some of the, the higher end talent guys in the state or outside of the state. And so I think they're going to be smart with these last few spots. I think if you look at how they've built this class, it's very strong on the defensive and offensive lines. They have their quarterback already. They have their running back already. Um, they have a receiver. Their linebackers are pretty set. Um, and so it seems like this class is pretty much all together, at least the base of it. And so now it's about can you go find, you know, maybe an elite cornerback. Can you go find a difference maker to rush the passer? Can you go find a difference maker at wide receiver? Those are a few of the positions that I'm looking at. But overall, this is going to be about trying to find two or three best available talent that you can add. And I think a big part of it is Baylor having a really good season. If they can capitalize on this momentum and win 
you know, double digit games again, I think recruits are going to notice and start to pick up on, oh, Dave Randers really got something going. This is very sustainable. I also think the offense is another big part of this in that Baylor last year was not extremely explosive offensively throwing the football. And I think if they can turn that corner this year throwing the football, I think you're going to get on the radar with a lot more of the, the talented skill position guys in the state for 2023 and also 2024, just kind of looking ahead a little bit. So a lot of work to do, but most of it is on the field work and then just targeting some of those priority guys late. So you don't even, do you have any uh, ideas who they might be targeting now? Yeah, I mean, one name that I, I kind of brought up on the Bearcats earlier this week, uh, LaGrange cornerback, Bravion Rogers, just decommitted from Texas A&M. And I kind of feel like, you know, the lean right now is LSU. And that's what a lot of people are saying. They think he's going to end up there. But I would say Baylor's recruited him, you know, really heavily for a while. He was at Baylor's junior day uh, back in January. He's good friends with Jaron Woods, who goes to the same high school as him he's on the same seven on seven team as austin novasad and uh tari and york so i mean he's got a lot of connections to the Baylor program and they've been recruiting him really hard and he's a top 50 player in the entire country a guy who's an explosive playmaker there at lagrange he plays both ways but he would definitely fit in at cornerback at baylor and is a guy that in my eyes could play right away because uh, he's just that kind of talent so he's one name that i've kind of kept an eye on um, you know, I've mentioned post outside linebacker Isaiah Crawford, who's committed to Texas Tech. Uh, I think he'll probably take an official visit as well. At least that was the plan this summer. So I think he'll probably take one in the fall. So to me, those are two guys to definitely keep an eye on, both high four-star type prospects that are, you know, inside the top 150 in the state. So, I mean, in the country. So again, Baylor really focusing on some of these high-end targets and maybe trying to flip some guys. Grayson Grunhey for Sikkim365.com, also on the BearCast and, of course, writing on the site uh, every single day, Sikkim365.com for our premium members. Grayson, thanks for hopping on a day early. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. It's Grayson Grunhey for Sikkim365.com. And, yeah, um, from what we've heard, I mean, you've been out there. We had Travis Roeder on yesterday, Grayson on today. Uh, just, and I know this kind of sounds silly, but if I could boil it down, the look of the team is where you want it to be. You know, they, they, they look confident. They seem confident. They look bigger and stronger. They look faster. They're building towards something, and you can tell that on the surface right now. Now, the proof's in the pudding once the season starts, but they look like they're, they're doing things to take that next step. Yeah, and I would hope so. I mean, they won a Big 12 and Sugar yeah. Bowl titles last year, yeah. so it's not like they're starting from scratch by any means. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, they're a team who just won a Big 12 and Sugar Bowl title who's now wanting to do that again and, and win more than that. And I think that they have the capability to do that. Uh, I was on Big 12 Sirius Radio earlier today, and they were asking me about the questions, and I just said, well, yeah, I mean, they have a new starting quarterback, even though he's technically not new, and Blake Shapin. But, again, he played two and a half games last year. People act like he played ten and a half. He played two and a half games last year, um, so that's a question mark to me. Can he last the season? I mean, if he can, then yeah, I like him a lot. But it's the same thing with Squirrel Williams. Yeah, he's great. Can he play more than two games? Cool. Then yeah, let's get excited about it. But I, I need to see. Like I understand. Like when Travis was on yesterday, like I understand when he or, or myself or Grayson or whoever the excitement behind certain guys, but just for me and how I go about like living, I'm not going to get super excited about Squirrel Williams until I see him get into conference play. You know, uh, that's just me as a fan watching. I'm not going to get like, I understand why there's hype. I get it. Like kid can run or kid, young man can run. He can move. He can, I mean, he can do a lot of great things. Same thing with Blake Shapin, but yeah, I mean, until you see him out there for 10 plus games doing it week in and week out, um, you know, there's still that question mark of can they actually do it and, and not just what their potential is. So I think potentially this Baylor team is off the wall good, not Alabama good, but really stinking good, like Big 12 champion good, go win a Sugar Bowl again. Yeah, I think they can do all of that, but they do have enough question marks that aren't are, that are unproven that, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, yeah, Squirrel Williams is going to stay healthy and he's going to run for 1,000 yards and Blake Shapin's going to be healthy all year and he's going to throw for 3,000 plus. And, I mean, that's that's what we're waiting. That's what we've talked all offseason about. Like, we're finally going to see, you know, I'm thankful that we get to see because if Squirrel Williams comes out of the gates and he's running and he's 
there in the postgame press conference, and he's back the next week, and he's running again, he's there the – then, yeah, I will lead the hype train. I will absolutely lead it. But I don't lead off-season hype trains, you yeah. know? And, and I'm not saying that those uh, people who talk guys up, and I mean, that's what we do in the off-season. I'm just reserving getting too excited one way or the other until we see them out there in a real game with real stakes and real opponents and not just uh, what has been practices so far or just our assumptions or our film watching in the off-season. But – Going back to where we started, yeah, on paper, the hype, okay, it's the hype I understand whether it's deserved or not. That's what remains to be seen, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah and, um, and I'm not going to contribute to it until I know that, the, yeah, it's justified. Um, but I get why it's there. And, and hype-wise, on paper-wise, yes, Baylor stands to be really stinking good. And Squirrel Williams will be a big part of that. And Blake Shapin will be a massive part of that. And, you know, maybe the wide receiver question is not really that big of a question. Um, you know, maybe uh, it, they just have guys that just pop in and, and are starters right out of the gates and can take over for what was done last year. And if that's the case, then, then yeah, man, they're going to be really stinking good. And I expect that, you know, even if a couple of the assumptions aren't exactly playing out the way that, that we expected. But the one that has to is Blake Shapin. Mm -hmm. Like, he has to be good. I, I, I know their defense will be good again, but I just feel like they're – they're going to be in need of him to throw the ball around to be a great team, not to just be a pretty good team. Yeah. Wide receiver is my biggest concern because of this. Not that these guys won't be good. I don't know that. But I do know that they had one great wide receiver on the team last year with a great season that was Tyquan Thornton. He was absolutely excellent for them last year. They had Drew Estrada, who's pretty darn good. They had RJ Steed, who was very reliable. But he's not there anymore. And then after that, most of the wide receiver catches were one-offs, and you just don't know. And that's what concerns me the most. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, they're guys who were just in high school not that long yeah, ago. Too. And, you know, it's one thing when you've recruited some five-star who's expected to just plug and play, be a guy right out of the gates, mm -hmm. you know, and most programs. But it's not like they have – I mean, they do have some highly rated guys. Like in Armani Winfield, like, yeah, it would be great to see him come in right away and contribute. Um, and I don't know so far – because we don't always, always have the best views or full views of practices, you know, where he is in the grand scheme of things. But, yeah, it would help immensely if some of these these uh, recruits would be able to just come in and, and help right out of the gates rather than having to develop and build up the experience. And, and that would be key. I mean, if they, if they look like a young wide receiver core that's not quite ready for it, that's going to be – you know, uh, uh, definitely a weakness of this team. But if, if they can come in and just not skip a beat because they're getting great blocking and they also have a quarterback slinging around and, and doing his thing, then, yeah, I expect them to be really good because I'm not worried about a run game, squirrel or not. I, I know they'll find a run game uh, with, with Jeff Grimes, but the passing game, that was hit or miss last year. And uh, if it's hit or miss again, then I think given their schedule and the number of tough road games they have, they're, they're not going to end up in the same position they were in last year uh, where they can just rely on the defense or, or just the running game. To me, for them to take the next step and to have a successful season with the amount of road games they have, they're going to have to evolve in the passing game, and that starts with, uh, with Blake Shape. And so uh, the hype's been fun. Uh, for all these different guys, but uh, yeah, I'm ready to see some answers now. And if Squirrel Williams is an answer that comes through, then I, like I said, I'll be at the the, the front of the hype train with everybody else, and we'll be, you know, as happy as him, uh, as happy for him as anybody. But we got to see it first. Next up, Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com. Their joint practice today with the Broncos before the first preseason game on Saturday. That's next. Sigma 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Holy cow, has it been a hot summer. You could fry an egg in the bed of a pickup truck. Jay here from Pickup Outfitters here to give you a little heat relief and some protection for your poor truck bed. August is bed cover month at Pickup Outfitters, and we're making it easy for you to cover up that hot bed on your truck with discounts of up to $200, plus matching rebates of up to $200, and double your warranty on many of those covers. That's up to $400 in discounts and rebates, plus double your warranty on bed covers at Pickup Outfitters. And you get our famous lifetime installation guarantee and free warranty assistance, which makes for a worry-free purchase. When's the last time you could say that about your bed, a truck bed? Get your poor bed some heat relief with a brand new bed cover, including name brands like Backflip, Undercover, X-Tang, Retrax, Rollin' Lock, and Truxedo. Up to $400 in discounts and rebates with double your warranty. It's only at Pickup Outfitters, 220 Lake Air Drive in Waco. 
are 26 letters in the alphabet, over 600,000 words in the dictionary, and just three of them said together can change everything. Let's order pizza. Those three words lead to dough made from scratch and three fresh signature cheeses that blanket golden crust in a heavenly melt on Marco's Pizza that'll blow your mind. So visit Marco's.com to order and stop by Marco's Pizza in Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and in Robinson. Marco's. Pizza lovers get it. Did you know that Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness is a partner of the city of Waco? Did you know that we are open to the public? Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness offers day passes to the public for only $10 a day, and we offer money-saving memberships. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness offers over 40 group exercise classes each week, including bar, yoga, boot camp, indoor cycling, and more. There are free weights, weight machines, TRX, rowing machines, stationary bikes, new treadmills, elliptical machines, and much more in the spacious weight room floor. Personal training available where you can be encouraged to grow. Sauna, Whirlpool, Tanning Bed and Kids Club, 17 tennis courts, 8 pickleball courts, youth and adult tennis and pickleball lessons. Waco's premier experience where you can help your mind, body, and soul. Visit our website at wacotennis.com. Call us at 254-753-7675 or visit us next to Hawaiian Falls on Lakeshore Drive in Waco. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Cam Heathcott, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Cam Heathcott, covering Conroe and Houston, 936 756 7717 or cam.heathcott at edwardjones.com. Edward Jones, member SI. PC. Brad Boozer, Boozer Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. I've seen people walk in there. First of all, you have so much to show. Well, necklaces, bracelets, rings. You have the watches. You have numerous great watches as well. You really have pretty much everything, don't you, when it comes to jewelry? That's correct. Kind of a one-stop shop and all. And the fact that we have the two jewelers on staff, the repairs we can do, the fixing of your jewelry, and the remaking of any jewelry has really set us apart from anybody else. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozer's Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air in Waco. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. And Prescott on the keeper walks in. Touchdown, Dallas. It's time for our weekly segment with Mickey Spagnola of DallasCowboys.com. Brought to you by the First National Bank of Central Texas with five locations to serve you. Welcome back, 365 Sports, Sikkim 365 Radio, Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com. And Mickey, the Cowboys had the joint practice today with the Broncos. I heard it got a little chippy on one of the fields. Uh, what was uh, what was that like to see, and does it give you kind of an idea of of where guys are when they when they strap it up against somebody else? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a good uh, workout uh, for the Cowboys. I think the Broncos came out with this idea that somebody was coming into their field and was trying to take over. I heard one of their players say afterwards, he said, this is our sanctuary. We needed to defend our sanctuary. And I'm going, it's practice, right? But that's okay. The, the emotions got high. There were a few uh, minor skirmishes, uh, nothing like we saw that year with the Rams. Uh, but, yeah, I thought that w- it was good. It was good work. Uh, I thought the uh, the Cowboys offense, when they had uh, their front line guys in there, um, I thought they, they played well. Dak was pretty good early. He was pretty good late in the two-minute drill. Uh, they couldn't cover C.D. Lamb. Um, he had, a, I thought, a big day. little struggle in the running game, so – they got to get this off offensive line kind of set. It's like, okay, here's our guys, you know, figure out who's the starter at left guard and, and go forward. I taught Tyler Smith for his first time against NFL competition from another team, uh, held his own for the most part. Uh, defensively, uh, I thought they leaked some things. 
Uh, but I, I, I kind of concentrated watching the offense in this practice. Uh, so the only t- times I kind of looked up and, you know, tried to see what was going on defensively, you know, you, they got about four or 5,000 people there and all of a sudden, you know, they're cheering everything, right? And it's like, oh, that must have been a big play. And you never know because they're not tackling, putting guys, uh, on the ground. You know, you thump them up and let them go. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I just thought it was good work. They got through it. Um, you know, it was 93 degrees and, and you're in altitude and they really didn't have, I don't know if you, if they had an IV problem, like somebody had to go in. Uh, so I thought that was the good thing. Mickey, they are, um, they're in a couple of, uh, let's just call it sticky wickets at positions. You know, we've talked about wide receiver at length and that one seems to be at least more, um, easy to navigate with some of the guys they have on the roster for, you know, what, what should hopefully be a pretty short amount of time without their full allotment, but kicker and swing tackle right now uh, are really kind of bugaboos. How do you expect to see them work that out with now Brett Maher in camp and without Matt Maletsko for a while, who they were hoping they would see uh, get some reps at swing tackle. How do they, how do they deal with that? Yeah, they'll keep the competition going at the kicker spot. Uh, Maher and Ira Luha uh, will kind of battle it out. Now they didn't do really field goals in this in this joint practice today. The kickers were off on another uh, field, uh, kind of trying to do their deal. Uh, but yeah, that'll be interesting. One, you know, I, I would imagine when you saw them bring in four guys, and the only name uh, almost you recognized was Brett Maher. That tells you what's out there. Now, guys can get cut uh, at, at the last cut down, and you might say, okay, maybe that guy's better than what I have. Uh, but of late, uh, Ira Lahu has been really good. Uh, you know, in those last two practices uh, where they kicked field goals, he was 22 of 23. Uh, so uh, Maher is going to have to, you know, be really good quickly uh, so they can, you know, if he's going to win the job. Um, as for the um, swing tackle, I think they got a problem there. Uh, I keep hearing it, you know, I see well, let's go out on the field doing some, you know, kind of, you know, the, the rehab type stuff. But again, an offensive lineman needs a shoulder. And, you know, with, with, with those kind of subluxations, um, I mean, you can, you can go back out there, but you know, how with a harness on, but how well will you play with the shoulder? I thought Josh ball, uh, struggled some today and, and he's had his moments when he has struggled. Uh, so that swing tackle spot, they're going to have to keep their eyes open on the waiver wire to see if anybody with any amount of experience that can still play and not be 35 years old. Uh, would come available. Was Brett Maher the devil they knew? I think somewhat, uh, but uh, I think the other thing that was uh, I heard was one of the deciding factors is was that his kickoffs uh, were much better. And, and I saw some, you know, you know, we didn't get to watch it, but from afar I could see balls fluttering on kickoffs uh, and not making it to the end zone. Uh, so, you know, he, he stepped in, uh, last year in new Orleans when, uh, when, when, when they had the injury and he went 16 of 18, uh, and he's got a decent leg. Remember when he, when he, that year, those two years he kicked for the Cowboys, I want to say he made one or two 60 yarders, um, in, in one season. Uh, it's just a matter of staying, staying accurate. And you know, these kickers, they'll get something in their head, which I think happened to Jonathan Garibay and they go South. So we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, they really, you know, it, it, tomorrow's a walk through to get guys ready who are going to play. And I would imagine on Saturday, you're not going to see many, if any of the starters. Uh, and then it's just really, you know, a kind of a practice on Tuesday back in Oxnard, and then they head to Costa Mesa uh, to practice against the Chargers. So really, from this portion of training camp, there's really only two days left. 
Uh, and then when they get back, I think they get two practices. Uh, and then the last game is on a Friday night against Seattle. So there's not many practices left here before they got to start preparing for the Patriots. I mean, for for Tampa Bay. Yeah, Mickey, the, the joke that uh, R.J. Ocho and I used to say in the press box about Brett Maher was for extra points, they should just take four false starts and then let him kick that, and then he'd be fine. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> just just do it four times, four delay games, move back, and and he'll he'll make the kick. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, some of the guys, you know, wide receiver is always that position that people get really excited about, but they're not really – you know, ever doing, everybody gets fired up, but uh, positive reports about Dennis Houston, Sammy Fajoko, Noah Brown, all, all coming out of this camp. And that's when they've been working with Dak Prescott. So it's not just, uh, you know, threes on, on threes and, and things like that. Uh, what do you, what have you thought about some of those young wide receivers and their ability to at least fill that gap until Michael Gallup is back and, and, and James Washington? Yeah. At this point, I think at this point, they, they've shown they're capable uh, now again, you know, part part of playing wide receiver is just not it's not just come down to running a route or catching the ball. Uh, you got to be able to read defenses. Uh, you got to be able to make adjustments in your routes at midstream, and and those usually are the things that young receivers that haven't you know haven't played in the NFL struggle with. You know, now the exceptional ones uh, go right ahead, uh, but some of the other guys. Uh, you know, they may, you know, take a, take a step back when the, the real thing starts happening. So we'll see. I, I just thought it was encouraging what I've seen from Tolbert. And Noah Brown is looking like a, a different receiver. You mentioned Houston. Uh, Brandon Jones made a nice catch today. Uh, so, yeah. But, again, can you consistently get, get open so Dak Prescott's not scrambling around back there you know, with his hair on fire. Mickey, will we see Will Greer on, on Saturday? Uh, that's still up in the air. Unfortunately for him, he strained a groin muscle uh, in, uh, let's see what they, what they did. In two, it, it was Monday's practice. Uh, he walked off. He didn't practice on Tuesday. He didn't practice today. Uh, McCarthy said that. They would take it to Friday and see how he is if he's going to play on Saturday. Uh, it, it, it's really a brat, bad break for him because I thought he was challenging for a starting job. And, uh, I mean, for uh, uh, the starting backup job, excuse me, with uh, Cooper Rush. And, any, and this would have been a great opportunity to get him some snaps against the Broncos. Uh, you know, he wasn't able to do that. They said they'll take a look at it Friday. Well, it's just a walkthrough, but they can judge if he can play Saturday. And if he doesn't get to play Saturday, you know, um, it, it, it's unfortunate because uh, they know what Rush is. They know what he can do. Uh, and he's always got that win on the road last year against Minnesota in his back pocket. Uh, but this, I thought this kid was coming on, uh, and unfortunately we may, may not be able to see him. Uh, on this Saturday. Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com. Well, Mickey, uh, I know you had to get in the heat today. Uh, do you get to go back to Oxnard, or w what are you yeah. doing? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we go back to Oxnard, and I got a shirt that I was wearing out there that uh, I think it's still wet from from sweat. We're not <laughs> used to that now. We got we got soft in Oxnard. Well, uh, you know, you got to tough it up. You're coming back into the into Thunderdome now. It's It's not good. Yeah. I know, I know what we're coming in for. Yeah. So you're flying solo today, huh? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Craig's here, but uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. So we're 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 without Smokey. You know, he just takes days off when he wants to. I mean, it's when you're the big dog, you can do that. Some things never change. Yeah, absolutely. Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys.com, dot com. Sick of three sixty five radio. Mick, we'll talk to you next week. Okay, sounds good, Paul. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Mickey Spagnola, DallasCowboys dot com with us, and. Uh, yeah, the Cowboys are in a couple prisons of their own making. Uh, kicker, swing tackle. Swing tackle has been a problem for them for years, and they still don't do anything about it. Uh, and kicker and, of course, the wide receiver. All things they knew, which is why I, I buy into the conspiracy theory that Jerry Jones is secretly trying to sabotage Mike McCarthy so he can go get Sean Payton. I kind of buy it. I mean, it's, I mean, he's not, but, like, he's not doing the things that you would need unless these are somehow McCarthy's ideas. 
does Jerry really have time to be just yeah, throwing exactly. away seasons? No, I mean, exactly. Like he's kind of old at this he's point. Eighty. Yeah, that's I, why I'm so surprised at the way they're approaching this, and that he's eighty, and they're not like. I think Cowboys fans are trying to convince themselves that like he's going to like he he must be doing that because otherwise why are they not winning the way they're yeah. supposed to? Oh, the the owner must be sabotaging them, but no, yeah. he's not. He's not, and he would desperately. Uh, I, I think he would do anything uh, to get that next Super Bowl win. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't think he's got the time. I don't care how rich you mm-hmm. are to uh, to be just throwing away years, you know, yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I just don't – you know how you roll into camp with Jonathan Garbay and Liram Haralahu and, and say, it's going to be fine, and not look at the way you've lost – like, they've lost games for three specific reasons over the years. Tyron Smith was out, the kicker missed important kicks – and the safety position was bad. And they've only done a little bit to address one of those issues. All there, if you, and, and, and penalties, but, you know, that's through several coaches. So I, I don't even know. When we come back, Craig Smokes off the radar. Second 365 Radio, 365 Sports. TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge Checking and Savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. Don Humidor, you're home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year, Aging Room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carol and Ashley. Don Schumanor in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby is a homegrown, family-owned and operated must-visit pizza place in Waco. Fantastic pizza by the slice or get the whole pie to share. Great happy hour specials every single day. And it's not just pizza. Great wings. You have to try the Sikkim sauce, chili cheese fries, pizza pillows, and more. Dine in for a great hangout or carryout. Order online at shortyspizzashack.com or do yourself a favor and bring your crew to the restaurant at 12th and Bagby. Shorty's Pizza Shack. Tell them Paul sent you by. Three Nations Brewing Company has 16 different beers on draft with a new beer every Friday. It also offers two air-conditioned tap rooms, a large indoor beer hall, a second-floor mezzanine offering a great overview of the brewing company and equipment and patio where you can relax under the shade. Plus, you can now experience the new Three Nations Beer Garden Grill on our shaded patio. Grab a cold beer and enjoy a bite from our freshly prepared and delicious menu. Street tacos, quesadillas, freshly cooked burgers and dogs, and veggie burgers, too. State Fair tornado fries, nachos, and so much more all prepared and cooked on site. So come visit the award-winning Three Nations Brewing Company on East Vandergrift off I-35 in Carrollton. Texas Farm Bureau Insurance has protected fellow Texans with auto, home, health, and life insurance since 1952. With more than 260,000 square miles of land and 27 million people, that's a lot to cover. Whether you're wrangling cattle or wrangling kids, we're proud to protect Texans in all Texan ways of life. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation.
Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. It's time for Craig Smokes Off the Radar. Brought to you by Pickup Outfitters. Since 1997, we've been outfitting trucks, SUVs, and vans at 220 Lake Air Drive or createacommotion.com. All right, so welcome back into Sikkim 365 Radio. Time for little off the radar, taking a look at stories outside of what we're normally discussing, which is uh, most of the time college football, the Dallas Cowboys. Of course, there will be a sprinkling of uh, both those things whenever the uh, the news warrants. Going, talking uh, recruiting site company gossip, that's a little too in the weeds, don't you think? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably a little too in the weeds. There's... There's there's probably not enough of an audience for that, so I, I may I may see how the 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 news cycle around recruiting websites behind the scenes uh, cultivates or matures over time before we start yeah. digging into that. But boy, wouldn't that be kind of a a weird thing for those people? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, looking through the microscope and all of a sudden the microscope's turned on you. Yeah, yeah, I know I don't want that either. But yeah, maybe maybe we'll touch that another time because I don't think that there's that much interest. But basically, what's happening is there's a little disagreement about the. Uh, Ohio State website, Letterman Row, and um, you know the umbrella that it's under is one of the the big recruiting companies. But now there's a lawsuit, so that's probably two in the weeds. We'll we'll get to that maybe another time if that becomes a little bit more interesting. Uh, all right, so elsewhere on to other matters. Uh, there is quite a bit going on outside the world of college football, but uh, college football is still uh, going to be our bread and butter, and that's why um, I want to start off with. Uh, Nick Rolovich, uh, former Washington State head coach. Uh, this came out yesterday, I believe it was, but didn't have a uh, cover three, and I don't think that we mentioned it. Uh, but he has filed a claim against Washington State University seeking $25 million for wrongful termination after he was fired last year. And you may remember that he was fired uh, because, well, he claims especially, uh, he did not want to get the COVID-19 vaccine. So in turn, uh, not a surprise at all, he has filed a wrongful termination claim over that firing. He's seeking $25 million. And uh, I'm sure that uh, that's part of, you know, the contract that he had remaining and, and all that came with that. I would think he would have more teeth if he had a better reason for it than my Catholic faith won't allow me to get the vaccine. Now, I know there's like different like levels of what's actually doctrine or whatever. But if I was the attorney on the other side, I would say, well, the Pope told everybody to get it. So... I don't think the church is against it, or the Pope's not going to go out and say many things that the church is wholesale against, uh, even though this Pope's a little bit more out there than the last ones. But when the Pope goes and says, please go get the vaccine so the virus uh, can get under control, your, the Catholic Church doesn't want me to get the, the vaccine kind of falls flat. I don't know how all that works. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. The vaccine's a hot button topic as it is, so uh, I don't know. I think he might have a case because you are, after all, forcing him to do something that he doesn't want to do, and he's citing the reason as to why. Um, and whether or not that's a valid reason will be determined in a court of law, uh, not by me. Well, so and, we'll and, see. Well, I mean, it was and it was a state. I'm sure there's going to be some kind of settlement here because, again, um, he's claiming uh, yeah. religious discrimination is, well, is what he's going with. That's what's gonna. Yeah. That's really what's going to hurt him because millions of Catholics around the world got the vaccine. So did they, I mean, I don't know how that really matters, but I mean, what he's saying is religious discrimination. It's not a tenant of his, the church he's saying. Okay. Is, yeah. So like, if I said you're discriminating me because I guess I'm Catholic. Okay. What did we do? You're making me take a vaccine. Is there any official doctrine from that church that says don't take the vaccine? If there's not, then they can't be. Now, they can be discriminating him for being anti-vax, which is a whole different thing, but that's not a religion. So, you know, like, I don't know how he can prove that, given that the church, uh, they're, they don't have an official stance that's against the vaccine. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that's all going to be for, for those folks in charge to figure out. I don't bring it up because I have a necessarily strong opinion about it. I just bring it up because it is of interest when a college football coach is uh, so in the university, especially when he lasted only 11 games over two seasons. I <laughs> have five and six record is what Rolovich ended up with. Uh, and so now Washington State has moved on, but they still have a little bit and, to take care of as far as uh, their former head coach. And, and thank you, Tony, for pointing this out. State law, pretty clear for he's a public employee. Okay. I mean, you don't know all these things. They passed it. You know, you can object to it, fine, but 
you know, wrongful termination based on religious discrimination. I just don't know how that's going to ha hang. Well, I just that's don't his problem to figure yeah. out. I'm not that worried about it, but that is a story that's out there. So we'll see how that goes for Wazoo and Nick Rolovich. Uh, elsewhere, uh, yesterday, it was announced a, a big pickup for the University of Texas in recruiting. And, and when there's certain notable things from time to time, I will bring up recruiting. I'm not going to get bogged down into it on a daily basis, but they did add Cedric Baxter, a, a four-star running back, to their 2023 class. Uh, Big-time player out of Orlando, Florida, Edgewater High School. Uh, four-star, but a very high four-star at that. Probably will be a five when it's all said and done, especially with the, the commitment. Uh, but he had offers from everybody, including, as you'd imagine, Florida State and uh, Alabama also involved as well. So big pickup for Sark. Uh, I saw some reference to, you know, this rejuvenation and recruiting for Texas and might have to get a Texas person on to kind of clarify that because when you look back at their rankings, I mean, it's all basically outside of one year, I think a couple of seasons ago, where they finished outside the top 10, which and it was like 14 or something. Uh, that was a awful year, right? But every other year, for the most part, has consistently been pretty much top five. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with uh, some of the hires they made. Brandon Marion to Shard Choice in the offseason. And maybe it's the assistant coach's part in this as opposed to like when Brian Carrington was recruiting coordinator and he's doing this all over social media all the time. And they were like, maybe it's just a different way of them doing it. Uh, when we get Jeff Howe or somebody on, we can get clarification. But it does seem that uh, Choice and Marion and Sarkeesian and uh, the rest of that staff that they've put together now has a... Uh, I mean, pretty much got them in the same place, quite frankly, that they have been. So figure that out uh, how you want to. But there does feel like there is a different sort of energy to it, of course, like any other time. We will yeah. see. But, you know, you got Arch Manning, you got Cedric Baxter, uh, you got another five star. Who's their other five star? Um, Okay, Williams maybe. Um, I'll have to look up that yeah. in a second. But, but they got they got a great class. Yeah. Their their problem isn't buying ingredients. Their problem is uh, that they're still raw when they take them out of the oven. Yeah, Louisiana safety Derek Williams. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so go. yeah, that's not been their problem is getting them there. Right. It's you know it's you know if you took them off the grill, you'd be like, this is still raw. Yeah. Like, you know you gotta you gotta develop them. You gotta cook them all the way through. Yep, and that's what the hope is. So they sit now at number three in the rankings. Uh, Notre Dame, number one class in the country. Alabama, this is composite rankings by 247. Texas, three. Ohio State, four. Georgia, five. Uh, LSU, Oklahoma, Clemson, Miami, Penn State. So a uh, lot of lot of blue blood in those top ten rankings, and I don't think that's ever going to change. But that Baxter commit was noticeable, or was notable for UT. So shout out to them. And again, we'll probably have Jeff Howe on soon. I would think to to just talk Texas and kind yeah. of the the feel that's around there right now. Um, but yeah, you know, Paul, we have seen this before, uh, and it's. Really hit or miss, quite mm -hmm. frankly, uh, the recruiting side of it. The Field of Dreams game is tonight. Are you excited about the Field of I, Dreams game? I, I do enjoy the Field of Dreams game. I do. I know it's not going to uh, – well, I mean, you're probably going to get into that. But, uh, yeah, I, I like it. I like that, uh, you know, you've got the – with the Reds and the Cubs tonight. Yep. Uh, those are teams that were around, you know, for that era. Uh, I don't think it's going to be able to be that all the time. But, uh, you know, at least the first few that they do will do it. But, yeah, I enjoyed it last year. Um you know, I enjoyed listening to Kevin Coster talk about the movie. I don't know if they're going to do that again, but yeah, just having the Field of Dreams game. I mean, have somebody – well, I mean, can't have poor Ray Liotta. We, we lost him this year. but There will uh, be a tribute for Ray Liotta. Yeah, yeah. so uh, – but, you know, have somebody else from the movie to kind of talking about their experience, what it means to them. Joey Votto had a great tweet uh, thread about it today, about how excited he was to play. And, of course, Joey Votto should be the next commissioner of baseball because – He's just awesome, and, and he, the way he loves the game and the way he treats the game and the stories you hear about Joey Votto make him the commissioner of baseball. He, he's the one who really cares about it, but about his dad and, like, it's to me, you know, especially someone who's lost my dad, it's, it's a movie that, that really hits home. So, I, yeah, I love the Field of Dreams game. Joey Votto will be mic'd up uh, for tonight's game. Uh, so will Ian Happ from the Cubs. So you will have them as part of the broadcast. And, uh, of course, they're going to, you know, make the, the ballpark a big focus, but it's not even the real – Ballpark. It's not the ballpark from yeah. the movie. It's adjacent to that because of just the way it's set up and the construction and all of that. But they try to make it as feel as you know close to home as possible in the feeling that the movie had. And in terms of that, uh, the uniforms that will be uh, worn tonight are going to be unique for both the Cubs and for uh, the uh, the Reds. The Cubs will wear their pennant winning nineteen. 
29 uniforms as far as the the jerseys and pants. They will wear a hat from the 1914 season, uh, while the Reds will be wearing uh, a set of uniforms that was kind of uh, put together from the 1914 to 1920 period of threads. So, um, yeah, we'll get a little bit of old school flavor with the unis as you would expect and as we saw last year. Actually, I've had one of those Cubs hats for about 10 years now. When my dad and my college roommate Stacy and I went to Chicago on our baseball trip, uh, I always get a hat from each of the teams. Sometimes I go nuts because the Padres had some really cool hats back in the day with like the friar swinging a bat. I got yeah. a couple of those uh, uh, instead of like the real one. Uh, the Cubs hat, I bought a Cubs hat and then I bought one of those. It's like a polar bear. It looks like a polar bear. Or it's It's a bear it's a white bear uh, on the hat it lo- really looks cool that's uh, the hat they're wearing yeah yeah so yeah. i have one of those uh the only hats i will not buy is you know when i went to yankee stadium they're not getting any of my merchandise money <laughs> and uh and the mets didn't get any of my merchandise money they 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 made more on me in alcohol anyway so it's fine you're but, anti-new york huh oh yeah i'm not gonna the mets and the yankees not well, gonna just, do it we just lost our rutgers fans out <laughs> there i guess <laughs> yeah yeah oh, i'm not well. gonna do it all right, uh, well, that will be tonight at 6.15 Central Time. Uh, that will be on Fox as well. Uh, but, yeah, you'll have the Reds and Cubbies in um, throwback uniforms, kind of from a couple different eras, putting it together for one. But uh, this seemed to be a success last year and uh, will definitely provide a, a different kind of cool feel to the game tonight. But uh, they did also release some news uh, that this will not be returning in 2023. Old White Sox slugger Frank Thomas, he's a part of the ownership group for uh, Field of Dreams, and uh, he said that construction uh, will prevent a game in 2023. So it's starting to become a tradition, but the tradition is not going to happen next year because they are – I guess, uh, redoing some things, and they've got some construction going well, on. Well, I think that's good because there was two families that owned the property split across for years, and that was Can never you imagine? good. Like there's imagine? That would be like, crazy. So, like, here's the thing that was so strange to me is, like, that is such a heartwarming, beautiful movie, love letter to baseball and fathers and sons, and then in real life, if you just want to go and walk around, buy a t-shirt and take some pictures in the corn, you have to pay two different people who are fighting about it, who obviously, and the, the end of the movie also sees, you know, Timmy the Busfield's character who can't see the, the baseball players, then see them and understand how important it is, and it's not about money and fighting and family and all these different things, and then in real life, forever, they were doing that, so it was ridiculous. So I'm glad to see there's an overall ownership group who can now make it into the tourist direction it deserves to be. Yeah, art imitating life. Uh, yeah, so they will not have this game uh, next year, but uh, tonight you'll get to see a little bit of that Field of Dreams action. College basketball, Tom Izzo signing a deal that will conclude his career, one would think, uh, with Michigan State. Five-year rollover. Uh, a Spartan for life is uh, what I've seen in a few different headlines. Uh, he'll make $6.2 million annually. He's 67 years old, and this will be his 28th season upcoming at Michigan State. But uh, the school announced that deal Thursday, a rolling five-year agreement. And, and, yeah, it's basically going to take him up until his retirement. So Tom Izzo, uh, Sparty for life. Uh, big news there in the college basketball world. Not a surprise by any means, but still no. big news nonetheless for one of the legends. I, I wonder what his farewell tour will be. I mean, will there be one? Yeah, will there be one? Will he? Are like, we going to do that for all this like generation of yeah. legendary coaches? I mean, he's one of the last. He's ones. one of them. Yeah, yeah. you know, like I, I don't like I don't know if you do it for Calipari. I don't. A lot younger, a little bit younger. That yeah. he'll have enough fans to do that. <laughs> you know, well, especially yeah, especially today when he's pissed off half the university that are football when I have, but the whole football team. He did that today. We'll talk about that if you don't get to it. No, but, uh, I think that's better for you to explain yeah. and take it to even a segment or something yeah, like yeah. that. But uh, but yeah, yeah, and. He's just, he's one of those guys that I think he's, he's one of those people. He's a hired gun to where like happy to have him, but you know, I don't have to, I don't have to throw my arms completely around it. Yeah, no, but uh, Tom Izzo, one of the legends for sure. So he's going to, no surprise, be a uh, Spartan for life, signing a new deal today. A couple of other notes uh, in the NFL, James White. Patriots running back announced his retirement today. Seemed like a little bit of a surprise based on some of the reaction I had seen to that. But uh, we do see in training camp sometimes that uh, guys that, uh, uh, you know, get cut at the end of this. That's what we're about to to ramp up for here in, uh, I think, about four or five days. We're going to get those first cuts down. But uh, today, James White uh, made his retirement. announcement that he is going to be retiring after eight seasons in the NFL uh, said New England will be in his heart for forever and he thanked the fans for their unwavering support over the years just 30 years old he's a team captain won championships in 2015 2017 
2019, but uh, calling it quits. Yeah, and uh, of course that Super Bowl 28 to three comeback. He was a huge part of that. Scored three touchdowns uh, in that game. Uh, you know, from Tom Brady. Yeah, James White was the ultimate Patriots running back. Yeah, absolutely for sure. Yeah, yeah. not a, not a dude who's like, oh, you pull his trading card and you're like, hell yeah. I mean, you know, it's but. Uh, as solid as it gets and definitely uh, he, a huge part of that franchise. He'll never he'll never buy beer in Austin. Right. Or not in Boston. I mean he will yeah. he will maybe not in Austin, in Austin either. Maybe there's a lot of Patriots fans. If there's a Patriots fan in his vicinity, his his meal and drinks are taken care of. Yep, just a couple more notes. Uh this is a behind the scenes, uh, I guess broadcast stuff, but Aaron Murray, former Georgia quarterback, is joined ESPN. He will be a college football analyst, will be a part of their various networks and also be uh, in, involved with their studio programming. So uh, the former Georgia quarterback's got a, a gig with the uh, worldwide leader. And uh, later on tonight, uh, NFL preseason. This is round two. There was the Hall of Fame game last Thursday night. There will be two games tonight. And then uh, starting tomorrow, basically everybody else who hasn't played already Ready, which is, uh, I guess, would be 26 other teams, will all start to finally get their preseason. I say finally. It just seems like it's been a while. But uh, they will all get their preseasons underway. And everybody not involved with the Hall of Fame game obviously gets four. And uh, then, you know, at the, by the end of that point, it'll be, be cutting time uh, coming up here in the next few days. And then a couple more after that till they finally whittle it down to uh, 53. But tonight, it will be the Giants and Patriots. Uh, 6 p.m. on NFL Network, and the Titans and Ravens will start at 6.30. So I would imagine uh, most of those audiences will be the betting variety uh, because there's not a whole lot of other reasons to watch preseason football, no matter how big of a fan you are. I mean, maybe the beginning of the game, but beyond that, I, I have to imagine that you are on some sort of a betting website, you know, seeing if this guy who's maybe or maybe not going to make the team is going to get six catches over under, right? I mean... That's that seems to be right up uh, Better's alley is preseason NFL football. So for those folks, Giants, Patriots, Titans, Ravens, that all starts at six uh, with that Giants Pats game on NFL Network, as I mentioned. And those are a few things off the radar. That is off the radar. Thank you, Craig. When we come back, Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal Constitution talks about the defending national champ, Georgia Bulldogs. Second three sixty five radio, three sixty five sports. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Nitchie Group Insurance Agency. With the Nitchie Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Nitchie Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Nitchie Group at 1-800-258-8302. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be a part of the Waco community. We're a small family business right here in Central Texas, and our goal is to bring down the cost of health care while maintaining high quality. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important, and unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. That's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through the difficult time. We offer premium MRIs just like a hospital with state-of-the-art technology and specialists, but you'll pay less. Sometimes thousands of dollars less, whether you're using insurance or not. At Ideal MRI, we accept most insurance and there are no hidden costs. Even offering financing if that's needed, everything included in the price, and you'll not get something as a surprise in the mail later on. If you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. They'll know. You can schedule an appointment safely from home online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or give us a call, 833-IDEAL-MRI, Ideal MRI. MRI.com. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one -on -one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Hey, this is Bryce Petty, former starting quarterback and two-time Big 12 champion. And I know firsthand the importance of being in top shape both on and off the field. So listen up, men. If you're feeling beat down day in and day out and looking for that high-performance edge that separates the men from the boys, then look no further than the Petty Clinic Low T in Waco. Petty Clinic is a comprehensive men's health care clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Board-certified Dr. Kent Petty has a special interest in offering the highest quality medical care to men of all ages. Some of the services offered include 
include screening and treatment for low testosterone or thyroid, infertility, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, while offering comprehensive wellness exams and complete men's health lab panels. High performance men, remember, it's not just a petty thing. This is Bryce Petty, encouraging you to reach out and Google search Petty Clinic Low T or go to PettyClinicLowT.com and get your complimentary lab screening today. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Single coverage, end zone, Five o'clock hour is brought to you by Edward Jones and financial advisor Cam Heathcott. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now here's Paul Catalina and Craig Smoke. Welcome back, three sixty five Sports, Sikkim three sixty five Radio. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, Smokey is back tomorrow, uh, and uh, we are joined by Chip Towers, Atlanta Journal Constitution, to talk about the national champion Georgia Bulldogs. And Chip, uh, this off season has uh, has been so full of non actual football news, all you know, kind of the business of college football news. So it's nice to start to be able to look ahead, and you almost forget sometimes. Uh, we had a national championship last year. Georgia broke through after you know 40 years to win, and this is a team that lost a lot to the NFL draft and, and graduation, but still pretty loaded for Bear. Is this a team that is built to defend that title? Yeah, it's, that's going to be really interesting to find out, and I think that's why we're all going to show up, uh, you know, for their games and everybody else's. It's the uh, – you know, it's the annual refrain. But what does make it different is Georgia did finally break through after years and years of, uh, you know, close calls and wondering why and all that kind of stuff. And really, I think they're connected. Where, where you were talking about, it is such a transitive time uh, in the in, in college football, in college athletics, period. Uh, uh, I just came back from a trip out to Oregon, you know, to catch up with Dan Lanning, Georgia's defensive coordinator, who's heading the program now, and, and, you know, we were talking about, I mean, look at the Pac-12. I mean, and, you know, two of their primary teams bolting for the Big Ten, uh, NIL, Transfer Portal, uh, all of that makes Georgia's situation, to me, even more intriguing because, you know, there's it's, it's not a normal year. There are so many extenuating factors. And what's so interesting is, I, this is the first year since Kirby has been the head coach that they have no transfers. Uh, and, and in comparison, I was at Oregon, they had 19 transfers. So it's just weird, uh, kind of the different places that all these programs are and how everybody is handling things. So, you know, that said, your question, I mean, I think Georgia – is in position to reload, much in the way that Alabama has. I mean, if you look over the last five recruiting classes, Georgia's averaged 2.3. The only team in the country higher than them is, is Alabama in that span, and that's just marginally. They, Georgia's had two number one classes. So, you know, it's people talk about they had 15 NFL draft picks and eight of them off the defense, but that these guys were going to be gone was not a surprise. Every one of those guys, Georgia knew they'd be losing this year. Uh, so they, they, they were prepared for them to leave. And those guys were members of one of those classes that averaged out at 2.3 over the past few years. Now, they're not going to be able to step up and immediately pick up where the guys that uh, were there before left. But they're going to be you – know, they're not going to fall off the face of the earth either. I think Georgia's going to be in the mix and, and laid into the game again. How different do off seasons feel when uh, you're coming off of one where a national championship was won? Well, it's definitely different, uh, but not decidedly so. You know, I mean, most of the uh, 
you know, most of that, I, I, I certainly don't want to sound like a coach here, but it was kind of done with all the parades back in January, you know, and mm-hmm. books and things like that that you had to deliver really quick. Um, you know, it, it, uh, Kirby and I have butted heads a little bit on this. As I, I refer to them as defending national champions. He, he's very adamant about, we're not defending anything. This is a, a brand new team. <laughs> and and it is. There's uh, The good thing about it, and I buy his uh, I, I buy his rhetoric that he shared at SEC Media Day was that you worry about complacency coming off a national championship if you got a bunch of guys coming back. But the good news, bad news for Georgia was a lot of those primary players on the national championship run are gone and in the NFL now. So there's some hungry dudes behind them, many of them who have been, you know impatiently waiting to get on the field we'll get to see them this year how confident are they in stetson bennett continuing what he did last year well very confident uh you know it's great that you asked that because today and and look we didn't know this was happening it's a it's a whole other story about kind of how georgia runs their sports communication operations but we we got to talk to todd munkin today the third-year offensive coordinator, as well as Dale McGee, the run game coordinator. And, you know, the national narrative is so interesting on Stetson Bennett, right? I mean, the the uh, basically the, the, the narrative is that Georgia runs, one, despite having a walk-on at quarterback because of a great defense. And certainly Georgia's great defense had a lot to do with Georgia winning 14 of their 15 games, including the national championship. But Stetson Bennett being the quarterback was a big deal, too. And Todd Munkin was talking about that today. Uh, JT Daniels was the quarterback going into last season. He got hurt in the Clemson game that Georgia barely eats out 10-7 to and then could never get well. So Georgia was kind of forced to uh, let their veteran Stetson Bennett take over. And that just opened a world of possibilities for Todd Munkin that he just didn't know were there, especially regarding Bennett's mobility in the RPO game. Uh, and so the thing is, that, well, uh, were they explosive enough and all that? I mean, Georgia was one of the most explosive teams in the country. They were fourth in the country in, 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 in yards per completion. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, how they were able to operate in the RPO game. You know, the guy ends up being MVP of the Orange Bowl, MVP of the national championship game. Uh, you know, they, they, sure, there's some, uh, some, liabilities that he brings being a five foot eleven quarterback, but you know, Bryce Young is a five eleven quarterback. Uh it's just it's just kind of an old narrative. But Todd Munkin talks about I mean, I think the most important thing with Georgia, they got a lot of guys coming back on offense, including Stetson Bennett, a six year senior. But now they've had a whole year to kind of like build on this kind of operation. Okay, this is what Stetson does. Uh, we can really utilize the tight ends here. We can take the top off when we need to. We can turn those tight ends into blockers and get some pretty good run game going. I mean, this is a really versatile offense. And, uh, guys, they are loaded on the line, on the offensive line. You lost some guys, but, you know, they got three starters coming back and just, you know, 15 different dudes, uh, you know, kind of competing for the other two positions and, and playing time at the other two tackles. So uh, I think George is going to be a pretty dynamic offensive team because of Stephen Bennett, not in spite of him. Chip, I can't remember, and, and I don't pr- pr- proclaim to have the greatest college football knowledge in the world, but I like to keep track of things. I can't remember the last time a team was so lauded just for their tight end group alone. Uh, do you have yeah. a, a comparison? Uh you know, not I, I did see. I think it was. Uh, I think it was Penn State sent out a tweet to, uh, to not too long ago. Uh, some of us saying they had the best tight end room in the country, and I was like, well, you might want to you might want to uh, search around a little bit there. This one is incredible and it's versatile. Uh, you know, Darnell Washington is six seven and a half, two hundred sixty five pounds. He can move. His foot's not hurt anymore, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, Arik Gilbert. Hey, the SEC freshman of the year from LSU, he's healthy and working out there. And let's, that's not even talking about Brock Bowers, who scores 14 touchdowns <laughs> as a true freshman. They signed another five star out of Atlanta in Oscar Delt. Uh, and they had two guys coming back anyway. God bless Brett Seether and 
uh, and Ryland Goaty. I mean, nobody even knows them, but they're they're actually veteran guys who would probably be starting on a lot of different teams. So uh, we asked Munkin today if, if he had any four tight end set. Did he have any? Uh, you know, did he run, run any fourteen <laughs> personnel? Uh, and and he he laughed about that and and said that uh, it, 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 he'd be lying if he said he hadn't looked at it. But it, you know, obviously that comes with cost. And Georgia has some pretty good receivers, and and they have a transition at running back position, but they're pretty high on Kendall Milton and and Kenny McIntosh, the next in the line of RBU of the RBU legacy. So uh, they they've got some options over there and. Those tight ends are going to be a big part of it for sure. Chip, uh, you mentioned the offensive line and 15 guys competing for two spots. One of those guys, and I've now blanked on the name that I was going to ask you, almost transferred uh, during the offseason. Yeah, Marius Mims. M- yeah, Mims almost transferred and came back. I mean, I know a lot of that probably has to do with NIL and the opportunities at Georgia, but given the amount, how is Kirby Smart even keeping him, people like that a way for out getting him out of the transfer portal, given that there's no guarantee that he is definitely going to be the starter. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? And, and that's what we're looking at. That's what I'm talking about at such a transitive time. I mean, the incredible thing about Amarius Mims, who was a five-star signing, number one, uh, you, you know, player in the state of Georgia, number one, two, or three offensive tackle, depending on which recruiting service you uh, ascribe to. And, and, uh, you know, he wasn't able to break into the lineup, was frustrated about it, and there were pictures all over the place. He enters the portal and pictures all over the place about his visit to Florida State, and everybody, he's going to go to Florida State. You know, Florida State has promised him this, that, and the other thing. Next thing you know, Marius Mims is coming back, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm certain that had to come with guarantees. Now, he's not going to, right now, he's not starting at either of the tackle position, but, I, you know, what uh, Kirby Smart has said that they in- impressed upon him, uh, having nothing to do with NIL, was like, "Hey, you got to bide your time here, and and that you can go other places and start away, start right away. But if you bide your time here, you know we 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 can develop you and make you into what you want to be. So right now he's the third tackle. Uh, you know you got left tackle and right tackle, uh, which are Broderick Jones and, and Warden McClendon." former five stars and four stars, by the way. And uh, they, they're, I mean, they look really, really good. And uh, But he would be the next guy in. He's worked some at guard, but I think part of this, I think that's part of the thing that kind of ticked him off. He found himself getting reps at guard, said, hey, man, I'm not a guard. And uh, so they'll work him in there as, as much as they possibly can. And O-line, there is not one offensive lineman in the SEC who, who completes a season without having to come out you know, because they're hurt. And, I, you know, I think they were able to prove that kind of statistically to him. But that said, what we don't know, and as a journalist, I have a little bit of a problem with this, is you're, you're looking at free agency in college football. Yeah. And you've got an NIL all over the place. You've got these different sites that are saying that Bryce Young's getting a million and, you know, Stetson Bennett's making 780000 But we don't know that. For a fact, and I think we should know what's going on behind there. And sooner or later, the NCAA is going to have to make some sense of it because these collectives were not in the plan uh, when the Supreme Court, you know, approved this stuff. Uh, it wasn't. It was supposed to be for alumni bases to gather money to dump into the pockets of guys that signed with their school. That goes against everything it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a guy. You're a good player. So you can go out there and make everything you possibly can off of your name, but it's going to be based on you, not on us. And, and that's got to change. And I think it will, I don't know how, but somehow it's got to. Chip, uh, before we let you go, uh, we do have a lot of West Virginia fans that watch uh, any thoughts on uh, JT Daniels and uh, his journey with the Mountaineers beginning here pretty soon. Well, listen, I, you know, I think any of us who dealt with JT Daniels are rooting for the kid. I mean, you know, uh, he's a the quarterback in college now. It's just it's just a just a head spinning phenomenon. Uh, you can only play one, and he's one of those five stars. Came out, went to USC, started as a freshman. Uh, he's really battled injury. He was uh, pretty unlucky uh, at Georgia in that regard. Uh, and you know, I think he's a good player. 
now he has to be in an offense that's built for him. Uh, he's uh, that West Coast quick game, distribute the ball around and quick pass game and hit them deep every once in a while. He's great at that. Um, but you know, Georgia wasn't particularly explosive on offense until he wasn't part of the offense anymore. So, uh, I, I root for JT Daniels. I, I, I think he can do a great job. There's, there's no question he completes 70% of his passes, um, as a starter at Georgia. So, uh, you know, he can distribute the football. He can pass it around, but that, that I, I think he's, he's only going to thrive in a certain, uh, style of offense. And you got to keep, you got to keep the defense off of him because he can get hurt. Chip, uh, you 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 mentioned earlier that you talked to Dan Lanning. Do you think he's going to hit the ground running pretty well there at Oregon? I tell you what, I, I mean, I knew that. I you know, having known Dan Lanning, being here the last four years, I, I mean, that's just one impressive dude. And uh, you know, to be thirty six years old in eleven years, guys, eleven years removed from being a wide receivers coach in high school <laughs> and in the third grade basketball coach. 11 years removed from that to get Oregon is the first job, but there's a reason. I mean, he's really organized, really energetic, and I went out there and visited with him, and I don't know if you guys have been out there, but, you know, Oregon is Oregon. It's everything that I heard it was in terms of facilities and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, I just think it's a matter uh, of, of – I'd be surprised if in the next four or five years he doesn't have them right back in the playoffs. And it may happen quicker than that, but I just think he has everything at that dispo- at his disposal, not to mention, you know, the template that's been given to him by Kirby and uh, Smart and Georgia and Nick Saban in Alabama before that. I mean, they, these are the guys that, that he learned from, and he's taken that template out to a place where they've already been proven they can win big. They have all the money, Phil Knight money, to, to back it with. NIL is going to be a good thing. Uh, who knows what conference they're going to end up in or whether they'll stay in the back pack well. But Oregon's going to be a major player, and I think Dan Lanning's going to, going to get them to the next level pretty quick. Chip Towers, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Chip, always love having you on the show. Thanks for hopping on with us today. Yeah, sorry. So I've been traveling and hitting these camps. Hard. It's hard to get <laughs> hooked up quick and, uh, quickly, but I'm always uh, happy to help you guys out and Best of luck going into the season, man. All right. Thanks, Chip. We'll talk to you soon. That's uh, Chip Towers, uh, Atlanta General Constitution. Always great to have him on. That's that's a Georgia dude right there. I mean, like his voice. I, I like I, I love it when we have somebody on from a region and you like I wouldn't even have to tell you what he's talking about. If I just said, say your name and the last thing you had for lunch, uh, you'd be like, oh, we was talking about the Georgia Bulldogs. Like you mm-hmm. just know it. Uh, I always enjoy that. And uh, Chip does actually absolutely excellent work at the Atlanta Journal Constitution has for a, a very, very long time. And I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with that team. I mean, like four teams sometimes that wait so long. Like, even if you're good again, there's a little bit of a, like, there could be a little bit of a letdown. It doesn't seem to me that way at Georgia because it, it seems like they're pretty loaded, but you wonder because. It's, it's, it's Kirby Smart's their head coach. Yeah, I mean, that's true. He's not going to let that happen, yeah. you know? Uh, I don't think he got to the mountaintop last year by, oh, well, we're here now. We can, yeah. we can just rest on our laurels. Uh, I think he realizes that Saban didn't win all those titles by just getting fat and happy after the first one or the second one or the third one or the fourth, I mean, so on. They're in that same position, man. So, you know, he could be uh, content, uh, but it sure doesn't seem like it. And uh, I just question uh, how many are they going to win with Kirby Smart leading that program? Yeah. You know, it's that, that's the question uh-huh. to me uh, is if they can add a second and a third and a fourth or, or what have you. But, yeah, I mean, they're going to be really good. Uh, they're not rebuilding. They're reloading. Uh craziest tight end room that we've seen in a, a long time and uh, a lot of other good skill players as well i mean they're, just, they're, they're georgia man mm-hmm. like it's it's uh it's one of those things where uh, you know their their worst year is going to be better than most everybody's best year you know still uh across the country uh but i know that's not going to satisfy their fans they want to have the best year possible and last year they were able to to pretty much do that. I mean, at the end of the road, they had done that. And, you know, we'll see if they can run it back. But, you know, they're going to be expected to. There's no, oh, well, they won it last year and they lost a bunch of guys to the NFL. They're not going to be as good. Like, there might be that thought out there, but that's definitely not the expectation out there. No, absolutely not. And, you know, I um, uh, I didn't ask him about this, but I do think it's a cool story. And it shows you how confident Kirby Smart is. So, at the annual uh, Florida-Georgia game, 
uh, which I guess they can't call the cocktail party anymore, but it used to be called the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. So at the cocktail party game, they have never hosted recruits because it's technically a neutral site game there in Jacksonville. And then each year they rotate who the home team is. So this year, Georgia is the home team. And Georgia is going to bring recruits to the game this year for the first time. It looks like they're going to do that. And the fact that like they don't like the, the problem was always like, well, if we do it one year, then they're going to do it. And so let's just not do it. Kirby's right. Doesn't care. He knows his recruiting class is going to be good enough to where he can roll them out, especially this year where Florida's got a new coach, as much as I think Billy Napier is going to do well, where they're more than likely going to win the game, and he's going to take that stamp to keep ahead of them because he also knows that Florida has a better recruiter in Billy Napier than they've had in the last couple of coaches, so he wants to get out ahead of it. I love that he's challenging tradition. I do. And again, Billy Napier is going to have that opportunity next year. I don't think it should be that big of a deal. You just know that it's not our year to have this, but uh, that he's shaking things up shows you how confident he is in what he's doing because you know there were like a lot of those rules are based out of fear like well, what if they do it well you get to do it next year it's fine it's totally fine i don't know what the rules are on texas and oklahoma what they do they rotate they rotate but i mean do they have recruits at that game yeah yeah see it's worked out it's worked out for those two schools about the same as it would anywhere else so rotate do it have a good time uh don't worry about it Take a break right here when we come back. Uh, get back into the chat, some of your texts that we haven't gotten to answer yet, plus more talk college football. Sing them 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Cars price right both day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks built for you, red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Count on us, a dealer to trust. Average car in Waco, Texas. It takes time to reach goals. It's a truth that applies to more than sports. It goes for your financial goals as well. You work hard for your money, and you deserve an investment strategy that lines up with your game plan. And Tom Albers, your Edward Jones financial advisor, can help. If your financial investments aren't putting forth the effort you desire, stop by today for a financial review. Tom Albers, 4301 Lakeshore Drive, 254-776-7605. Edward Jones, member SIPC. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible challenge. Hi, this is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like First Free Checking, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. The First National Bank of Central Texas, familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. It's pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy. And, you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here, too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more, stonewood-dental.com. Brad Boozer, Boozer's Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. Boozer's Jeweler's on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air Drive. It's a staple of the Waco economy. And you're about to approach this time of the year where you have the holidays, special gifts. It's not that you don't have that every single day. What are some of the things you have coming up? You know, we kind of call ourselves the wedding ring store. We do all of our own custom work in-house. I've got two expert jewelers on staff every day. We can make anything from scratch. We kind of pride ourselves, probably nine out of ten 
every engagement ring we do is actually made custom to what the customer wants. People look at that, oh my God, I can't afford it. I can't afford something like that. You've shown me examples that you could fit pretty much any budget. It doesn't cost any more to custom make something. You still have gold, you still have diamonds, and you still have labor. Best thing about a custom piece is if you have any old jewelry or heirloom jewelry or something passed down from a grandma or somebody, we can take that jewelry and use it towards your wedding ring for the sentimental value. And then you've got the product and then it's just a little bit of labor and a little bit of design on your part of what you actually want. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozer's Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake care in Waco. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Are you a Sikkim 365 super fan? Then try out our premium subscriptions at Sikkim365.com. Welcome back to 365 Sports, Sikkim 365 Radio. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke. And uh, one thing you'll learn the longer you're on this earth is that history can and does constantly repeat itself. Many years ago, Bear Bryant stormed out of Kentucky and to Texas A&M because Adolph Rupp got a Cadillac and he got a cigarette lighter uh, at the end of the year and, and knew that Kentucky was a basketball school and not a football school. Well, today, and I doubt this will happen, but in ever uh, continuing to promote that it is a basketball school, their head coach, John Calipari, and I teased this earlier in the show during Off the Radar, uh, has said that he no longer wants to wait for athletic director Mitch Barnhart to greenlight the project for his on-campus practice facility, which he wants to be right in the middle of campus. He will go fundraise for it if he has to, and he will get some of his 50-some NBA draft picks who've earned more than $2 billion as pros to contribute. He says the state deserves that. Everybody should be behind this. Our administration, look, our baseball facility might be the nicest in the country, and I'm happy about that. Our football facility, we spent $200 million. Soccer, unbelievable. Now the track, I love it. And now I would say the administration should be like, we're doing this. How about the state? If this is the University of Kentucky and it's a the basketball program for the state, which it is, I'm sure Louisville fans are loving that. We're in. We're going to invest. I'll tell you right now, Anthony Davis gave $350,000 on a text to me for flood relief. Do you know what our former players would do? They just got to see it. What is it? So it's the next challenge. And then he said this. And the reason is, this is a basketball school. It's always been that. Alabama's a football school. So is Georgia. I mean they are. No disrespect to our football team. I hope they win 10 games and go to bowls. At the end of the day, that makes my job easier, and it makes the job of all of us easier. But this is a basketball school, and so we need to keep moving that direction and keep doing what we're doing. Mark Stoops, the football coach, tweeted, basketball school? I thought we competed in the SEC. Hashtag four straight postseason wins. But John Calipari, and look, I believe he'll get it done. I mean, they're going to build what is going to be palatial. They had a flood and they had leaks uh, in the roof. The, the floods in Kentucky is going on right now, but they had uh, leaks in the roof in their practice facility a few years ago and had to cancel practice, and he's kind of been on it since then. But uh, one thing you'll know about John Calipari, he is not afraid to say what's on his mind and be very bold in that. And that certainly is when you somehow – innocently rope in not innocently but like rope in all your other programs and say why hasn't this happened for basketball uh we talked at the very beginning about uh, programs that use history to win every argument mm -hmm. uh right now kentucky basketball is one of those programs yeah i mean they are the arguably one of the uh, whatever direction you want to go i don't really care uh greatest basketball programs of all time they haven't won jack squat basically with calipari there i mean i mean they, they won one yeah but like not last year yeah i mean like it's it's you know, it's Kentucky basketball, and it's a big deal. But uh, quite frankly, Mark Stoops has had more success here as of late. Yeah. So he's got every right to turn right around. And I'm glad he sent a zinger back Calipari's way. Um, I, I get that everybody needs what they need. Uh, but, yeah, Calipari, for a guy who's not sitting there with a you know fresh national title in his back pocket, is certainly still acting as though that is the case. And I, I get it. you got to fight for your guys and fight for your facility and whatever it is you want. There's only so many dollars to go around. But I, I just love the fact that Mark Stoops isn't taking that ass, and he's uh, willing to have fun with it. And I'm sure some of that was fun, probably the majority of it. But there's also some real – there as well i think that's pretty clear that there's probably if they pass each other in the hallway respect but I, I would imagine there's a little bit of a cold like i meant what i said and yeah i meant what i said you know uh, i don't think there's a you know a standoff incoming but 
I think Mark Stoops has every right to feel the way that he does. And Calipari, I don't think it's any surprise that he feels the way that he does. And especially being at a school like Kentucky where basketball is, is king, um, you know, I, I'd probably feel much of the same way. But, yeah, I, I just love the fact that uh, that – Mark Stoops is sitting there gun loaded, ready to, to fire back, so to speak, on, on social media. Uh, that was, uh, and that's probably not the best. You know what I'm saying, though. The, the verbal uh, machinery loaded and ready to fire back. Well, the other thing I don't want to hear if I'm Mark, or Mark Stoops and I'm trying to get recruits to come here and I'm, I'm, I've got my most loaded team so far, yeah. my best quarterback so far well, is. I, yeah, I mean. Technically, it, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, sure. you know what I think is my, what I hope is my best, best NFL prospect at quarterback. Yeah, my yes. NFL cross, pr- prospect at quarterback so far. I've got that. Um, at least Mark Stoops. I mean, I know that they had Tim Couch there, but uh, but I've got. I just mean a lot of the Will Levis stuff is is all mostly about his NFL career yeah, and yeah. not really about Kentucky football as yeah. much. Is is at least what I found in reading through the literature. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I've got this NFL prospect at quarterback. I want all this stuff. The last thing I need is the head coach of the of the basketball program which everybody knows is good and he's going to use to use each other to recruit is saying that the sport you're coming here to play is not that important they have to fight that off anyway you look mac brown has to do it in north carolina all the time uh you know it it, it happens you know like uh nobody wants to be uh lance leipold and have to worry about like the chasm between those two programs and that national championship and worst team uh in the fbs maybe uh but you don't need the head basketball coach saying this program is not as important (laughs) it's just not it's one of those things that it's petty that somebody will use against you but it's also you know, not what you want to hear, especially when you're something that will lead to Mark Stoops going and taking another job at a football school one yeah. day. Because he's doing well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, dude, if the Florida State job opens up next year, uh, I think there's a candidate well, in, he in the, Kentucky. He was the D.C. there. I mean, That's he, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So, like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's a basketball school. All right, well, I'm a football coach in the SEC. I'm going to go to a football program, you know, yeah. and I know Florida State's not in the SEC, but um, I can see where, like, this is not – as big of a deal as it's probably being made out to be. Yeah. But I think there's a little underlying something to it for sure. And, 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 and he responded be, because of that. So yeah, I mean, it's great to be a basketball school. If that's what you are And Kentucky's had, you know, a hell of a history uh, in that regard. But, um, you know, it's also pretty important to have a really good football program, which is not something they're necessarily just fully accustomed to. And so I, I think that if you're, you know, the Kentucky AD, you're like, all right, boys, like let's, you know, culturally, mm-hmm. it's good if you're both good. It's yeah. good if you, like, both respect each other and it's not like a tug of war over who gets what. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see if that just, you know, fades away. But uh, I like that, again, I, I just like that Mark Stoops stood up for himself and didn't let Calipari just, you know, run his lips without any, any sort of a response. Yeah, I've uh, I've been in a couple different press conferences where John Calipari was there uh, covering when they, they played Baylor uh, in, the, uh, in the Elite Eight. Uh, I was I was there for that, and um, that was it was interesting the first time where it's equally impressive, and you're like, man, this dude really thinks he's awesome. Oh yeah, it's oh, like yeah. where you listen to him, and you're like, wow, because uh, they asked him. I remember the, I'll always remember this. They asked him a question about AAU basketball and how it was starting to turn into something that was kind of shady when it came to recruiting. And he's like, you call it AAU basketball. That's what you call it. I call it summer basketball. And that's you kind of turn around like, that's your problem. And I was like, well, it's called. How very Jimbo Fisher of him yeah, and exactly. Saban and all these yeah. other guys. Like, the that's same what you call crap. it. And you're like, and I was like, man, that was a really, you know, D head move there. And then I walked away, like getting on the elevator. I'm like, although I was kind of impressed by that, how we turned the whole press conference around and be like, oh, well, I mean, you know, it's not really what he calls it, you know, and, uh, but yeah, it was ridiculous. And then, you know, you see times where I was at a game, uh, in the final four that he lost and the way he spun out of that one where he's like, look, this isn't a big deal to me. I just worry about the kids. Like, no dude, it's a big deal to you. Like you are, you know, you are getting these top recruits all the time. You're saying there's no problem with one and dones and it's undoing you right now. Like, yes, you're in the final four, but again, ask Bill Self how it feels to win a title and then go forever until you win another one. It's hard. You know, you keep pushing, push and push. And you know, he never pretended like it wasn't a big deal. And he was like, yeah, starting to get to me. I like, it's those things that you just don't believe. Like, oh, no, I don't. Like, and when they won, he was like, this isn't a big deal to me. It's big for the kids. Dude, you've been doing this for 40 years, and you finally won one, and it's not a big deal to you? Shut up. No one believes that. 
Yeah, I could take or leave Calipari. I really could. I don't. I mean, I I respect the dude for, for what there is to respect. Yeah. But I, I I you know I'm not I'm not entertained by him really in any shape or form. And I think just taking a shot at your own school in a roundabout way, which is clearly not the way that he was thinking of it at the time, is just kind of stupid. Especially when they've got a, a, a good amount of momentum. You know, potentially a a top pick at quarterback. Uh, as Stoops points out in his tweet, you know. Uh, postseason wins stacking up and a little bit, little bit of expectation in, in the biggest, you know, baddest football conference out there. I mean, that's that's a job that's been uh, that's been incredible to watch unfold with what Stoops has been able to do and, and the amount of respect he's been able to earn. Even though they're still, of course, a very long way off from being, you know, the the top of that league. I mean, shoot, there's reasons for excitement. Why are you trying to dampen the excitement in the same, you know? Same same place that you are. Like, does does Cal Parry not realize that football being good is good for everybody? Yeah. Because guess what? Guess who still makes more money than Kentucky basketball? Kentucky football does. Yeah. I mean, in terms of rights and things like that. I don't mm-hmm. know about fundraising. Fundraising, it might be a different story because it's just different up there. Uh, but, yeah, I, I not a huge deal. But definitely you can feel a little bit of that tension there uh, over between those two. And it'll be uh, really... Interesting to see, uh, you know, how Kentucky football does this season with all of the hype that's uh, pretty much surrounding Will Levis. Um, but, yeah, they've got a good thing going, and, and good on him, again, for firing back and not bowing to the uh, to the legendary college basketball coach. I'm sure he didn't know how to even take that. Yeah. I bet he's like, oh, wait, he responded? Yeah. You know, like, did he call the school president right afterwards to tattle on him or something? Yeah. I, I wonder how he took that because I don't think he's very used to it. Yeah. Uh, and, look, if Kentucky, they're at Florida in week two, and they just beat Florida for the first time in forever I'd, last yeah. season, if they can get that one, they're probably undefeated facing Ole Miss – uh, on October 1st. And again, that's a big, like you can, re- there's a, there's a way here. If they're really as good as they think they're going to be, where they can go into face Georgia with one loss or less. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case, but this is a team that could win 10 games. And, and they end with Georgia and Louisville. Louisville has a coach who's coaching for his life this year, but a quarterback who's super athletic. So we'll see kind of what happens with them. But uh, this is a team that in the SC, in the SEC East, there's not a whole lot in the way. Is Tennessee going to be better? We really uh, got know. a really easy schedule on yeah. paper compared to to what they uh, otherwise could have drawn. I mean, like being at Knoxville in late October. I mean, who the hell knows at that point what anything looks like? Uh, because Tennessee is also a team that feels like they're going to you know be making even more progress under Josh Heupel. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that that week two game with Florida, I think, will be a pretty early fork in the road. Uh, man, Northern Illinois, they're in week four, close out September, at Ole Miss. So, you know, not easy by any means, but it's not like they've got, like, LSU, well, an LSU this year wouldn't be as daunting, but you know what I'm saying. It's not like one of those murderers row SEC West, you know, combined with the SECs where you're like, it's it's Bama when they're good, and LSU when they're good, and then it's A&M, and then, and then you take on Florida, and then you move over and you play Ole Miss, and then you play, you know, South Carolina on the road or whatever. It's It's manageable. And if you've got a high-level NFL quarterback prospect like they do, uh, and he turns out to be as good as, as some people expect him to be, uh, again, I think a lot of that is is primarily just the, the pro buzz. But, I mean, there's there's valid buzz at the college level as well. It's just I think more of the talk is because is of the pro thing. But, yeah, I mean, we'll see what they can do. But uh, that's a, it's a manageable schedule. Um, and if they can, yeah, stay on – I don't know. It, 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 I'm going to be curious to see where, where they end up in all this because I could see them being 500. I could see them be, having that dream season where, you know, they get into that final month and things get really uh, interesting with a couple of those games. But I, I don't know. I, I'm not I'm not all in on Kentucky football being great this year yeah. by any means, you know. But, yeah, there's a, there's a path for them to be really – really good and there's a path to where you know look if you fall back into losing in Gainesville which you've done yeah I mean the at, last 20 times you've been there at Florida at Ole Miss at Tennessee uh yeah. you know those three right there I'm like I, I don't know and then Georgia late in the year that's at home um that's their next to last ball game Louisville to close it out so yeah I mean I could I can see a case for both both you know some teams say well if this happens we'll go this record Best case scenario. If this happens, we'll go this record. Worst case scenario. And I kind of do that with Baylor. It's like worst case scenario, they should be 8-4 and four this year. Yeah. Anything other than that, that's a massive disappointment. Um, you know, barring there's like a major injury of some sort, knock on wood. But beyond that, Baylor should, has no business going any worse than 8-4, and four, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know what Kentucky standard is 
in this or what the the ceiling that the the fans out there think that it is but yeah i could see both sides of the coin uh if you want to make the argument for it being a, a really great season or you know ending up being just kind of more of a, of a middle of the road type of a thing yeah uh let's go to the uh, text line real quick two five four three three nine eleven twenty two i think there's a this is from shooter uh, i think there's a very good chance that the big 12 will be bidding a bidding war between espn and fox espn needs to fill the inventory and once the spread of time zone that the big 12 offers fox wants to shut espn out shut out espn so they need to lock up the big 12 and get us to collapse the pac 12 that shooter um here's what fox doesn't have as many channels as espn does because they sold off all the rsws and all that now they have fox and fs1 and i think something else i'm leaving out but they're not like they're not buying wholesale and like espn has all day sports you know fs1 is going to be part of that but some of that is big 10 some of that is some of the else that they have so fs1 doesn't have as much fox doesn't have as much inventory to sell as espn but uh espn's always they've always shared stuff because you can't really do everything everywhere uh you know the sec is going to do it on espn and that's that's what makes it interesting to me to see how that goes down but yeah i don't know if it's going to be a real bidding war craig i mean Say say all this again. What are we talking about here? Uh, Just to, I need clarity now. Yeah, a shooter said that he thinks the Big Twelve will be a bidding war between ESPN and Fox because ESPN needs to fill the inventory, and Fox wants to shut out ESPN, so they need to lock up the Big Twelve and get the Big Twelve to collapse the Pac Twelve. Man, I'd have to kind of like Charlie from Always Sunny. <laughs> like yeah. the whole uh, is that Charlie? Is yeah. that yeah? Okay, I don't watch that religiously, but. I'm not as much of a, a buyer into, like, this is some network civil war going on. Um, I think there's some element to that. I think that both are moving their pieces across the chessboard to best position themselves. But, like, I don't know how deep that really goes and how much that involves, like, trying to crater somebody at this yeah. point. I don't really feel like Fox has to do that because they've got, um, you know, their L.A. representation and um, – you know, the pack is, is we got to see where they're going to land first. I mean, yeah. because like you could say all that and then tomorrow they announce a deal with, you know, the people that we think are not going to want to be involved with them for all we know. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I don't really have like a strong argument for or against that, but yeah. I'm always interested to hear people's opinions. I, and I, I like I, my, my point was, you know, Fox only has a couple channels. That's yeah. where ESPN has like, you know, they have ESPN, ESPN two, ESPN, U. Uh, who is he saying is trying ABC to kill who again? Film. I'm sorry. Uh, Fox would try to, kill espn like yeah, shut out espn on that day. i don't think that they're all that worried about trying to kill i mean you can't kill espn for yeah. one and, and two i don't think that they're all that caught up in it given the moves that they've made at this point i mean it's really it's espn's turn to respond now if they even feel the need to do that they were the ones that swung big initially with uh, ou in texas and i know we could probably go further back than that you know but uh fox just had their response with the la schools so uh now you know we're all again waiting on the big 10 and notre dame and uh, where all that falls but yeah fox is about to fox is about to uh, have it big with with kevin warren and company so no I, I don't i don't think that there's any kind of like collaboration or motivation in that regard no and, and again uh, espn will bid for a part of the big 12 maybe the majority of it and then there'll be another part that goes to another network probably fox you know probably yeah so yeah I, and it, it benefits everybody that you have multiple people because They've made one big deal for all of it, and that's the SEC because they want to be all in on that because that's the big money driver. And, you know, the Big Ten didn't – the Big Ten turned ESPN down. The ESPN didn't turn the Big Ten down. The Big Ten turned them down because they wanted to do something different. So now ESPN can respond to that how they want to. And Yeah, and Bob Thompson, like the, the network guy that uh, we talked to the other day, uh, he had a tweet because I, I, I had recalled this from yesterday – that somebody was talking about, uh, yeah, thank you, right there. The best nuggets from this this John Auerrand podcast, who's a sports media guy, was that Fox and ESPN aren't at war, and Fox wanted ESPN to get a piece of the package, but the Big Ten thought that they were too pro SEC. So that when you start talking about like the Fox versus ESPN and all that, I mean, I think there's probably more, um, there's more congenial things going on than we probably think. We probably think it's like you know only one can survive type of thing and it's not really like that no and, and look espn being the only well, i mean fox has fs1 it's a 24-hour sports network but i mean honestly do you watch it you know when people aren't watching espn but you know it helps the brands 
obviously that on ESPN that they really focus on, but being too pro SEC is, I mean, they want, they're the exclusive home of the SEC now. So I can see how the big 10 would feel. Yeah. They're pretty pro SEC because it benefits them because it, they don't have to share them with any other network. Now they don't have to share them with CBS or Fox or anybody else. And the big 10 also benefited by the fact that NBC said, look, uh, we've got the best college football brand, the most recognizable one uh, on with us in Notre Dame uh, for all their home games uh, in neutral sites and all that. Uh, and then, and then if we add another conference that is only going to be better because live sports programming is what moves the needle and we can grow our stuff that way, then that worked out for the Big Ten that way. And, you know, it works out how it works out for everybody who's Yeah, let's get to something different. Let's yeah. get to, we spend way too much time on this one question. A absolutely. All right, let's see. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I lost uh, track of the chat room. I'm sorry. Oh, Flush Jackson. This was really funny. Uh, also, how dare Calipari make me defend Stoops? What a monster. <laughs> He'll do that. I mean, yeah. if anybody's going to be a guy that will have you turning and supporting people you never thought you would, it'd be John Calipari. I mean... I certainly wouldn't be lining up to have his back, uh, you know, right away. So, yeah, uh, that's that's what that's the effect that he can have on people for sure. Yeah, that's absolutely true there. But uh, yeah, I I, I, well, I had to get to that Calipari story because it's so interesting to me for you know a coach to to say just come out and say yes, this is a basketball school, everything else is less important, and not be political about it at all. Uh, it's funny that uh, he actually believes that. Yeah, uh, that that that's that nothing else is important. Yeah, I, um, hope, I hope they win ten games. Okay, great. Yeah, it's you, you realize know. them winning ten games is like transformational for the entire university, whereas you winning another championship is yes, uh, celebrated and all that, but it's not transformational per se. Football being at a different type of a level in the SEC in particular, in this era in particular, is going to have way bigger. Uh, reactions and way bigger ramifications than Kentucky winning another basketball national title. And I'm talking about outside of Kentucky uh, in particular. Yeah. And I can, I can tell you, you talk to any coach on any staff of any sport. When the football team is not doing well, their job is immensely harder. Yes. Yes. Immensely harder. Because when you bring in your recruits for any sport, and say like, hey, here's a big thing. Like, they, you want Saturdays to be fun because you're trying to convince – kids in their teens and early 20s that the city they're going to live in has fun Saturdays. Even if it's only seven or eight a year, it's a fun Saturday. Like, that's what it is. And if you roll into a stadium that has 15,000 disinterested people in it because your team's getting thumped all the time, it's hard to say this place is cool. Every coach loved it. When Baylor started getting good at football, they started getting even better at everything else. It's no coincidence. Everywhere else is the same. You watch, listen, you know who you really want Texas A&M to bust through the top? Buzz Williams in football. He would love it. It would be great for him. No losses there for him because people can say, hey, this is, place is good all the way around, top and bottom. I want to be part of that. That's how it works. So it's kind of silly to me that Cal Perry would do that. Top five up next. Texas A&M fans may or may not like it. I don't know. Sick of 365 Radio, 365 Sports. This month, Alan Samuels is having to make this the summer event on the new 2022 Ram trucks. Designed to be durable, functional, and stylish, these legendary award-winning trucks give you that first-class feel. Luxurious leather trim seating options, exceptional leg room and storage, plus surround view camera options that you'd expect from a premium truck. Come see our selection today or browse online at alansamuelsdcj.com. Alan Samuels in Waco, the place to shop for Ram trucks. Baylor University is where lights shine bright. So, let there be light. Let there be roommates and teammates, scholarship and championships. Let there be fresh starts and new traditions, fast friendships and lasting impacts. Let there be laughter. Let there be joy. Let there be light. Baylor University, where lights shine bright. Let 
Daniel Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one. Commercial, farm and ranch, or residential, Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction. With a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you, Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, warm. Welcome home. It's summertime. There's picnics, reunions, cookouts, and so much to do. And Waco Custom Marketplace on Lake Air Drive in Waco is your home for the butcher shop that can help you with beef, pork, poultry, and seafood. They are spectacular at being able to deliver you whatever cut of steak you want. Bone and ribeye, however thick you want it, that's great. They'll do it. Sirloin, T-bone, porterhouse, bacon wrap filet. And, of course, as I mentioned, they have pork, poultry, and seafood. Their Norwegian salmon is spectacular. Also, all of the sauces and seasonings you'll ever need, all the ingredients you'll ever need to make sure you have that perfect, flawless taste so it's delicious whenever you take something off the grill. And a full-fledged bakery as well with fresh baked bread and kolaches every single day up and down the aisle of Waco Custom Marketplace. You also have what you need from knickknacks to snacks to more at 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. Waco Custom Marketplace. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lake Shore Drive, North 19th Street, right behind the bank, is a hidden gem in Waco. If you're a fan of bourbon, especially local Texas bourbons, that's where you gotta go. Balcones, TX, Devil's River, whatever it is, they've got it. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, plus the best selection of craft beers in Waco, seasonally churned out throughout the year. Whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter, Riverbend Liquor and Wine, best selection of craft beers, a speedy drive through window, and excellent customer service. Find out more on Instagram or just go by and see them. Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street behind the bank. This is Paul Catalina's Top 5 at 555. Welcome back. Second 365 Radio 365 Sports. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, Garrett Ross, Levi Caraway, Emery Winter, Jack McKenzie was here earlier. It'll be me and Smokey tomorrow. And uh, then the full team back together on Monday. Top five ways Texas A&M can live up to the hype. Number five, defense was really, really good last year. They've lost some pieces off of that uh, to the NFL draft. But maintain and improve on that defense. Now they lost Mike Elko. He's the head coach at Duke now. Uh, Durkin, DJ Durkin steps in as the defensive coordinator, one-time head coach at Maryland, and then he was at Ole Miss last year. He is at AM now. Can he maintain that defensive prowess that they had last year and or improve on it? That's going to be tough. I know he's he's well thought of, but Mike Elko was a name with a with a bullet, and that's why he's the head coach at Duke now. Uh, who's well thought of? Mike Elko. Okay, I was going to say DJ Durkin. It depends not, on who you ask. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people would say, no, he's not well thought of, uh, given his history. What happened at Maryland, yeah. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I mean, defense is is really their, uh, their strong suit. And, I mean, that's where I'm assuming a lot of this buzz about this year is coming from. Uh, not so much about, you know, Devin A-Chain or, you know, maybe whoever you want to point out skill-wise. I mean, I know there's excitement on that side of the ball as well, but it just seems like their defense is their bread and butter. That's what they built up for. Uh, Johnny's the one that set the world on fire offensively, but uh, what they've really been able to establish now is, you know, great defensive linemen and uh, really tough defense and just being that SEC mentality and all that. I mean, that that they've been building up and that they have now. Um, you know, can the offense uh, play its role, uh, you know, like bread and butter together to, to make the whole package – uh, SEC championship caliber. I mean, that's what we're waiting to see. But, yeah, I mean, defense is going to have to to be as good and better in some cases, especially if the offense isn't up to par, you know, right away or maybe at all, uh, all year. We have to see. Yeah. If you ask me, and here's the thing, this is a team that was always in their great years built on defense. If you ask me of my lifetime, the greatest players that AM has had, it would be Johnny Manziel one, probably Mike Evans number five, and everybody in the rest of the top ten would probably be defensive players. Yeah, I didn't grow yeah. up really thinking too much of anybody AM offensively related. They were the wrecking crew. I mean, yeah. that's who they were, and I haven't thought about them in that regard in a while. I mean, um, but that's how I, I came to know them. So, yeah, I mean, getting some of that identity back, 
Uh, you have to have the offensive piece of the puzzle, of course. But, uh, yeah, they're a defensive team uh, more so than anything. Yeah, you talk about Sam Adams and Quentin Corriott and Dat Wynn and, yeah. and all, you know, uh, Marcus Buckley, like guys like that, William Thomas, which just bad dudes that they had uh, back in the day on defense under R.C. Slocum. Uh, number four, replace the departed stars. Look, Kenyon Green's gone. Isaiah Spiller's gone. Uh, you know, Jalen Weidermeyer is a big part of their offense. I know he's he's – Probably going to struggle to hang on to an NFL roster. He's gone. Uh, they they lost they lost a lot of bodies, a lot of really good players that helped them. You know, you lose. You know, Kenyon Green, one of the best offensive linemen they've had in a long time. Uh, you don't just kind of replace him and expect that to go on, Garrett. I mean, like that's he, he's a good dude. I'm le- and I, I'm leaving people out. Yeah. Uh, uh, contributors like uh, you know Leslie o- or Leon O'Neill uh, was one of their their guys. He's he's gone. So veteran things they've got to replace those departed stars and running back. They're probably fine. Isaiah Spiller was, but Isaiah Spiller was a workhorse. Mm-hmm. And you know Devin A. Chain's great. He's fantastic, but can he be a workhorse like Isaiah Spiller was? Uh, who's gonna? I think gonna be an excellent pro uh, with the Chargers. Can you can you replace that? You know, go ahead, Gary. Oh, I I don't think you can. I, I think Isaiah Spiller was a transformable player. I mean, and I think that he's gonna have the opportunity to have a successful career. A Kane, I mean, I think he's a, he's suitable for the system, but. Try to counter that. I don't know if he can do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, number three, get something out of that recruiting class right away, whether it's it's probably going to be Evan Stewart at wide receiver. That's a, a position that they have open and need help with. Uh, and I would think Walter Nolan on the defensive line would be the two you can expect the most immediate production from. But um, that's what – Alabama does, and that's who you're shooting for, and that's what Georgia does, and that's who you're shooting for. Not everybody contributes in that recruiting class, but when you recruit studs, the studs play and the studs contribute on those teams. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just say what I've been saying about a and I, I, I have no, you know, axe to grind with the program. I think that they've made a lot of really great moves over the years, but I, I'm just on the, the end of, like, uh, I want to see something greater yeah. than 8 and 4. I mean, quite frankly, that's just it's, – it's as simple as that. If they finish 9 and 3 this year, then, hey, a little bit of progress has been made, and then next year you want 10 and 11 wins and whatnot. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is what's kept them in the headlines – and the occasional win over Bama or yeah. a seven overtime win versus LSU. It's been recruiting. And then it's been, you know, whatever uh, kerfuffle Jimbo Fisher's involved with. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, the, the big win that they get that that season. And um, recruiting is, is the lifeblood, I understand. I also think there's an entire industry built on it. And so there's a focus on it, yeah. you know, if there wasn't that industry. Uh, because we didn't talk. I, it was talked about, but it's like really become the thing, you know. And it's the lifeblood, and it's this, and it's great, but, you know, culture is also important as well. Yes, you have to have the players, but you also have to have the culture, too. Um, It seems like they've got a good culture going on. They've clearly recruited really well, and, yeah, they're beyond the point where, you know, they just sit back, and and those guys have time to develop and do all that. Some of them will, but, no, they need Evan Stewart to be a star. They They need the guys who are stars to be stars quickly, and to uh, and to make impacts quickly, so yeah, get you know all those classes are great, but you can't. Well, just wait a couple years for these guys. No, some of those guys, yes, but they need to see some instant impact for sure. Yeah, if they're real studs, like you know, that can compete with Alabama and Georgia. And look, this is a team that has been the SEC for a long time. They have two wins over Alabama and one over LSU. Man, it seems like more than two the way it's talked about, but doesn't it? Two, yeah, two wins over Bama. And one went, doesn't one, it? It seems yeah. like they beat them like no, five it really times. Does. You would think they would like year in and year out. They'd be going back and forth or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. That's that's wild to me to think that. Yeah, it's only yeah. it's just been those two. But yeah, anyways. in the, in their in their side of the conference, two wins against them. Number two. Uh, normally, I would say this is uh, the most important, but QB play. We've talked about it a lot. They don't know who their guy is going to be yet, and that can be. You know, I know this as as a Jimbo Fisher expert. You know, there was the. Um, uh, debate like he kept it like Jameis Winston might not be the starter the year he was going to mm. be the starter you know we really like you know um, it's almost like you can barely believe yeah. what yeah, coaches exactly. and primarily yeah. Jimbo Fisher say at the time but Coach here speak. you know Haynes King is a high recruit Connor uh, Weigman's a high, hot recruit uh, Max Johnson is a transfer you know we'll see but again uh, Jimbo Fisher's dream scenario is that Haynes King is the quarterback for the next couple of years that's what he wants you think and, then so? Connor, and then Connor takes over, I would think, because then that reinforces his recruiting, right? 
because then the line, you know, it falls in line with what he wants. Yeah, if you're looking to bat a thousand, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that you're just looking for whoever the, the yeah. dadgum dude is. Like, who's who's the best quarterback? Because I don't think you can really um, have the luxury of, well, this guy will start here, and this, you know, they all plan that way, of course. Yeah. But I I think whoever's the best dude uh, needs to be the the guy, and if that's Connor Weigman, then then so be it. But I, I know that there is a little bit of let's have some patience with him and all that. So yeah, I mean, it should. It should, in theory, be either Haynes King or uh, Max Johnson, uh, you know, but given their history, uh, everybody better be ready to play. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really the thing is, you know, the starter is one thing, but odds are there's probably going to be another quarterback at least that will play significant reps, so everybody better be ready. Yeah, absolutely. And number one, don't get upset. This, is, this has really been their bugaboo uh, in years where you beat Alabama. You finally did it again, but you lost to Arkansas, who's improved, mm -hmm. and but you had a really nice long winning streak against them. That's not a team that if you were really better and a contender, you would have lost to. Now, yes, quarterback play had a huge part in that game for A&M. You don't lose a game you have in control to Ole Miss. Uh, they, have, they were in control of that game and lost it. Now, that was a really good team, too, so that one's more of a toss-up. You don't lose to Mississippi State, and you don't lose to LSU after they've decided to fire their coach. That's just, you you yeah. don't lose those games. They lost four games last year. They should absolutely not have lost. Bottom line. And uh, one of them, Ole Miss, I'll give it, you know, the toss-up, but they should not have lost to Arkansas. They should not have lost to Mississippi State, and they should not have lost to LSU. I say they shouldn't have lost them if they really were a contender. But those games proved that they weren't. Is Arkansas in their head at this point? Well, I don't know. I, like, I don't know. A&M seems to have more of the the, the victory. I mean, they, they've had more of the success. Um, yeah. So, no, I don't think so. I don't, I, don't, think so. I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, we'll see, but yeah, that, <laughs> that it's was, always a, it's an interesting game, though. Yeah. I mean, always, yeah. yeah, it's definitely an interesting game, I, and it's I, so I don't think that they're in their head so much as it's just a, it's a good little rivalry. You yeah. know, it's a good little rivalry. It was a good rivalry in the in the Southwest Conference. Mm -hmm. It's a good rivalry now, and I think the the most painful part for Arkansas fans was there were games where uh, really mediocre A and M teams had almost blown it, and then Arkansas just let it go. I mean. Uh, I think last year was one of the happiest days of Jerry Jones' last 25 years uh, in that Arkansas <laughs> won that game uh, in front of him there. So, yeah, they, they just they cannot lose. A, like, if you're good enough to beat Alabama, you shouldn't lose the rest of them. Yeah, Bottom line. I mean, that, that's, you know, if you think back to, like, their 2019 year when they had, you know, multiple losses, but all of them were the top five teams, like, that's okay. You know, if that were to happen this year, like, you lose four games, and it's like, oh, you lost to the number one at the time, and the number two at the time, and the number four at the time, and the number three at the time, like, okay, like, what are you going to do about that? I mean, come yeah. on. But it's, yeah, it's the other losses, though. It's the, the random Mississippi State loss. That you're like, where the hell did that come from that is the killer? So, yeah, they can't afford to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for us. Thank you to everybody who's been on the show today. Grayson, uh, Chip uh, Towers, uh, Ralph Russo, uh, all in the program today. Mickey Spagnola, thanks to Levi, Emery, Garrett, Jack. Smokey's back tomorrow, and all of us back together on Monday. Sing 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Have a great day, everybody. Ideal MRI is a small family business right here in Central Texas. We're open to support you while lowering the cost of health care bills. When you need an MRI, ask your doctor for an Ideal MRI. Visit us at IdealMRI.com or call us at 833-IDEAL-MRI.